<laughs> it was summer, just a few years ago. I sleep in a bunk bed with my brothers in the room that we share. I woke up one night from the top bunk. Like I said, it was summer and it tends to get pretty stuffy at night, so the window was open. I could hear a very slow, raspy breathing and the sound of the screen from the window being scratched. I quietly rolled over onto my stomach and looked over the side of the bed, down at the window. It looked like a man, but its features were just wrong. It was as pale as the moon and bone thin. It had long arms and it had a hand with long fingers scratching at the screen of the window. Its eyes gave off a soft glow that sort of lit up the room a little bit. It was looking around the room from behind the window. It wasn't even trying to get in. It was just examining the room. From what I could tell, it hadn't spotted me yet. And I couldn't get out of the bed without it seeing me. So I just crawled over to the other side of the bed and laid silently, terrified, until morning. It had left after about an hour, judging by the digital clock on top of the TV. And the next morning I went outside and studied the window. Whatever had been there had to have been at least seven feet tall, because the window was about five feet off the ground, and this thing was hunched over. A few weeks go by, and I go on a camping trip. My brothers were in the Boy Scouts, and I was allowed to go on the camping trips, which I love because I've always loved the forest. It was in this enormous forest, in the middle of nowhere, and the property belongs to someone from Scouts and there's nobody else for miles. Everything goes fine. Fun days of fishing and hiking and s'mores. Everyone's about to get in their tents and everyone's silenced by an echoing, blood-curdling scream. It was absolutely not a fox. And there haven't been any mountain lions in the entire state for centuries. So it couldn't have been one of those either. Somehow, everyone was able to get some sleep after that. I convinced myself to get into the big family tent. And soon, I'm out cold. I woke up to the sound of the tent fabric being scratched at. I look around, and on one of the walls, long scratches are being made periodically from the outside. I turn on the lantern hanging from the ceiling and it stops. I can see its silhouette. It's the same thing from only weeks before. Large, bone thin, with long arms and legs. It creeps away and begins to do the same thing to other tents at the campsite. I wait for it to finally leave and I turn off the lantern and somehow I was able to fall asleep. My dad's into paranormal stuff, but I don't know how he'd take all this. I haven't told it much, and every person who cared to listen didn't take it seriously. I haven't seen it since, but whatever it was had followed me from my house in the suburbs to the forest, out of town. I've always slept on the other side of the bed since then, away from the window. After some research into it, I think this might have been a skinwalker. My family moved to Pennsylvania when I was four. I was immediately entranced with living in the country, with several acres of woods behind us, and the house seemed huge to me at the time. However, as a kid, I was always sensitive to spirits and energies, and there was definitely something creepy going on in this house. My parents noticed that I stayed with our dog Bambi a lot. He was a small sheepdog and my adventure buddy. When we went walking in the woods, in case you're questioning my parents, they trusted me as young as age seven to walk around alone as long as I was with my dog as he was very protective of me and 
My dad would give me his cell phone to carry with me in case I needed any help. Up until I was about 15, I spent a lot of time alone by choice. After school, I'd be home by 3.20. I'd eat lunch and immediately take Bambi out into the woods and we'd explore the surrounding forests and fields and meadows and ponds together. He was always right by my side and he seemed really attuned to spiritual stuff too. And if I felt something was in the house, he'd bark at it or whine or I'd watch him follow it around. Usually he'd pick up on the presence of something at the same time that I would. Anyway, from my backyard to the left, there is a small strip of trees. And in the fall and winter, when the branches are bare, you can see the field next door, which is about 300 yards from the house itself. There is a big plane shed up there and a kind of runway where my neighbor would fly his biplanes off. What's kind of important to the story is that I have no neighbors for a mile in any direction. It was pretty rare to see any kind of people on the surrounding properties, unless it was my neighbor haying the fields in the summer. But one day, in early fall, I had begun tromping through the woods with Bambi for several hours. I let him run off leash most of the time, but he would only run ahead about 20 feet and keep turning around to check that I was still there. If I lost sight of him, he'd retrace his steps and find me again. That day I got caught up in whittling something so Bambi ran off a little bit and I suddenly realized I was alone. Then suddenly, there was a lot of crashing deeper in the woods and I heard Bambi's alarm bark and a lot of yelping and then some screeching. Raccoons and gophers make really fucking scary distress sounds so I figured that was it. So I called Bambi and he popped out of some bush, covered in pickers, and since I was spooked, I ran right back home with him. Right as I got to the back door, I stopped to catch my breath. And Bambi and I were just standing there when I spotted someone or something standing on the very edge of the runway. It ran along the higher end of the field, and then there was a steep drop off the edge of the hill at the very end of it. It didn't appear to be wearing anything distinctive, but even in the dusk, I could see that they appeared completely black, or everything about them was very shadowy and dark. This is the part that gives me shivers now. And they were standing, facing off the runway, and then I saw them hunch over, then slowly raise their head and yell, Bambi, in the same high voice I would use to call him. It had the same vocal inflection as me too, but it sounded like they were trying really hard to sound like me. Next to me, Bambi tucked his tail under, lowered his head, and growled softly. It called again but this time it sounded like they were losing their voice, as if they had been calling for a while. In my eight-year-old logic, I assumed that someone was trying to steal my dog. But why would they stand in the middle of the field and be obvious about it? When I told my parents about it that night, they dismissed my story. The next day, I went to my cousin's house two miles up the road, and my uncle told me about an animal he saw the night before that he was trying to identify. He said it looked like an emaciated cow sprinting across the bridge over the creek, which is about 300 yards from the runway. Also, since then, anyone who's been at my house has always been uneasy around the creek in the plane shed, whether or not they're interested at all in the paranormal. I know that a lot of death happens in nature, but I've also found several goats ripped up in the field. In the nearest house with any amount of goats or farm is nearly four miles away and a lot of unexplained things have happened up there. My husband and I are avid campers. We live in Southern California and go out to the mountains as often as possible with our two dogs. I'm from Oregon and grew up in the woods. I did search and rescue religiously and spent much of my time going on trail rides and hikes as much as possible. 
just to give you an idea on how much experience we have. We've been married for two years and have already been on over 20 camping trips trying to visit as many different spots as possible. Sometimes even switching campsites for a weekend, only spending one night. But this last trip scared the camper out of me and it may be a while until I'm ready to return to the woods. We stopped by a favorite of ours called Holcomb Valley Campground. We set up camp, played with the dogs, and went for a small walk on the many back roads and some of the short trails, just revisiting our favorite areas. The dogs acted normal, running around off leash and playing. We were comfortable and calm and came back to dinner and hot chocolate before it got too cold. Then we slipped into our tent for the night. Me being pregnant, I have to go to the bathroom often during the night. I got up around 2 a.m., grabbed my flashlight, and brought one of our dogs, a golden retriever, with me. Now, don't let the reputation of the golden retriever fool you about mine. He was raised without much contact with other people, except for family and our other dog, a pit bull mutt. Moose, our golden retriever, is very alert, doesn't like other people, and growls to warn them off. And especially after we became pregnant, he is overprotective of me. Both our dogs are fit and used to go camping and going off leash, they don't leave our sides. So Moose and I made our way to the bathrooms and of course, he came in with me. While I was doing my business, Moose's ears pricked straight up and he growled his get away growl. I was nervous, I didn't bring my knife like an idiot and all I had was a flashlight. Figuring it was just someone needing to use the bathroom, I ordered Moose to stay by my side and we left, but no one was there. Moose's hackles were up so high, he looked huge, and he was pressed up against my legs so tightly, it made me almost have to pee again. But we fast walked all the way back to our tent and jumped in. I made sure my knife was there. My husband was okay, and that our pit bull was okay too. Everything was fine, and Moose relaxed a bit. Laying down right next to my head, I eventually fell asleep. Now, here's where it gets really disturbing. I woke up about 45 minutes later to a low woof from Moose and our pit bull growling. They were listening intently to the side of the tent, both of them almost shaking. I put a hand on them to calm them down, and that only made them jump and growl even more. My husband is such a heavy sleeper, I knew I couldn't wake him, so I got a knife ready, and I listened. I would say it was about 40 or 45 feet away from us, something stalking over the fence that divided the campsite from the road. It sounded like deer with light feet just barely crunching over the ground. I had been camping with herds of deer before and it sounded very much like that and our dogs had never seen a deer before so it made sense for them to be scared. I laid back down and just quieted them saying very clearly shh it's okay guys just a deer. And then the deer outside said something in almost my same voice just the deer. This voice said it like it was practicing something. Like how you rehearse a line you just can't get right in a speech. I gasped so hard, my dog started shaking like crazy. My husband jumped up and hollered at them for scaring him. I listened, almost in tears, for the thing, but no sound came. The dogs were on edge for what seemed like hours until they finally calmed down, and it wasn't until then that I was able to fall asleep too. When I awoke the next morning, it was from a bad dream. I just remembered running barefoot and my feet were cold from being outside of the sleeping bag. It was near 5 a.m. and the dogs were on edge again. This time I didn't hesitate. I grabbed my knife and sat up, listening to everything. I said clearly, are you there? Towards the direction of the fence, but nothing said anything. 
I think I repeated myself about two more times until a coyote howled. It was far away and clear. I was starting to calm down thinking it was silly for thinking that something like a skinwalker was out there when the coyote howled again, this time much, much closer to us, like right across the road close. And this one was not a coyote. It was high-pitched, then would end in a hoarse growl type voice. It did it again, and again, rehearsing the howl over and over. My husband woke up this time asking me if it was a coyote. Petrified, I told him, I don't think so. This thing howled for over 10 minutes until it stopped and finally left. My dogs were just as scared as I was. That morning, we went for another walk, then packed our things to move to the next campsite. Moose ended up vomiting most of the day, and that kind of made me panic. He was so on edge. He couldn't keep anything down, and our pit bull was listening to anything and everything, never leaving our sides. That night, we were at a completely different campsite on the other side. So nothing happened, and the dogs were finally able to get some sleep. The next day, we stopped in Big Bear for lunch. Moose was all better at that time, and we all went for a walk in the village. When we ran into our neighbors, we recognized that Holcomb Valley campground. We asked them about the coyote, and they suddenly went pale. They told us about what happened that night. We'll call the woman Mary and the man Ben. They had a small dog named Benji. They said Benji had to go out in the middle of the night, so they unzipped the tent and let him do his business. He just ran to the fence and was barking until Ben went out and got him. Ben said that across the road he saw a man standing there. When he waved a hand, the man ran away into the woods. All night, Benji and the other dogs were barking like crazy until a few hunters went to investigate. They had their bows and a couple of knives and a few trained hunting dogs with them. They crossed the road and went after the man to see if he needed help. They got about 20 feet on the side when the man screamed at them with something between coyote and those dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. Quoting Ben. It woke everyone up, and one guy claimed the thing shifted before them into something like a deer with impossibly thin legs and bounded away faster than any animal possibly could. My husband doesn't believe in that kind of stuff, so he shrugged it off as people being tired and the night being so dark. But I know that it was a skinwalker, and that's enough to keep me away. So, for people who love to go camp up in Big Bear, be careful when you venture up into those hills, because there's something up there. I'm half Navajo and half Mexican. For over 20 years of my life, I've lived on the Navajo Nation Reservation The Native American side of my family always warned us to be careful at nighttime. My grandparents would always tell me stories of these shape-shifting witches that can curse you, kill you, or just mess with you. They called them skinwalkers. They called them this because they would take the skin of dead animals and wear them to change into the shape of that animal or something in between a human and animal. Not like a typical werewolf, though. I never believed in it, really. I'm only half Navajo and very light-skinned, so I was never treated the same by most of the people here. I drifted away from the culture and thought it wasn't for me. It was around summertime when this happened. I was in high school. It was about six to eight years ago. I was around 15 or 16. I used to hang out with a group of guys who like to do a lot of delinquent type stuff. You know, smoke cigarettes, stay up all night, 
the guys who always come over to somebody's house to play video games, and then at 3 a.m. if we felt like it, we'd go sneak out to Paradise. I know it's ironic, the name. It's basically a giant metal pipe that carries irrigation water to all the farms in the area, but it was also a spot for kids to get drunk or high in the evenings. However, the place did have a scary history of kids and adults who drowned or died in the night, but I always thought those were just urban legends. But at 3 a.m., that was our time that we as boys would test one another to cross the pipe sort of an initiation kind of thing, see how far you could go. We usually could go all the way across. Now keep in mind that pipe goes well over three stories high. It's also pretty wide, I'd say as wide as an average car. We would walk this thing for kicks in big groups early in the morning, so one night me and a small group of friends were driving around bored at two in the morning, wanting to spook each other, so I said let's go to paradise and walk the pipe as most of the friends I was hanging out with had never done it like I had. They agreed. They were pumped up on energy drinks, and we started driving there. It was pretty quiet. The sky was dark and the night was cold. And we got to the place, and one of the kids didn't want to go. Said his parents were very traditional, and he just wanted to chill in the car. He probably just wanted to text some girl, I'm sure. I told him it's fine, keep the car locked and running in case we see something scary. Me and the other boys went on without him. As we got onto the pipe, a few of the guys were scared and had me take the lead. As we crawled, I'd say one-fourth of the way up the pipe talking and laughing, I noticed a faint white or light gray bat bigger than my head flying around us. It dived for us a few times. We dodged it at first, but one of the kids slipped and almost fell off of the pipe. I reached out to him, grabbing his right arm. One of the kids grabbed him by the shirt collar, and another one grabbed his other arm. Altogether, we got back on the pipe, shaken that we'd almost lost our friend to the dark depths below, but at least the bat was gone. We were a little freaked out, but the guys wanted to continue. We laughed about it as guys usually do. We passed the halfway point on the pipe with no problems, but as we continued, one boy Michael saw something. At the end of the pipe, there's a hill. Behind that hill, it is very brightly lit because of a church somewhere off in the distance. But on that hill... There was a black figure with pointy ears, kind of like the silhouette of a dog. Now, Michael was a tough guy, so he yelled at the thing, saying, I'm not scared of you. He even tossed a few rocks he had in his pocket. One of the rocks hit the pipe and the others fell into the brush below. The shadowy silhouette stood up on two legs, like a human. We all freaked out jaws dropped. Then someone pointed, saying, look, there's another one to the left, and another one to the right. So three silhouettes of pointy dog-eared people on the hill. I told everyone to back up so we could get back to the car. The things to the right and the left of the hill started to move down towards us. Now there was just one standing guard on the top of the hill the one who had first stood up. We were trying to hurry back, but we had come so down the pipe in complete darkness it wasn't going to be quick. There was silence for a few minutes. Then we heard a girl crying. It sounded like she was hurt and scared, almost in pain. We were overcome with a strange feeling of wanting to help. Michael wanted to go back towards the end and crawl down and help this girl. I almost followed too, but inside I was like, no, this is wrong. Something isn't right. I yelled at him and everyone, telling them they're stupid. Telling them, look up there, on that hill. Do you not see what those things are? This is a trap. That crying has to be fake. 
And if there's a girl hurt, we'll come back when the sun's up in a couple hours and check. Now, the moment I said this, the crying stopped. All the guys freaked out. They can't believe what came over them. They said they'd almost forgot what we saw before. Halfway up the pipe now, we started to hear a native drum being played. We started running. Running on top of the pipe to get to the car. Corey stopped us. We can all hear it under our feet. It sounds like a pack of snarling and growling yelping coyotes. It's pitch dark below, but we know they're under us. So we run full speed, not looking back straight to the car. We jumped in and started yelling and took off, hauling ass down that dirt road back to a well-lit gas station. We explained what happened to her driver and we couldn't get the girls crying out of our head. We did go back in daylight just to make sure, but we didn't find a girl. Instead, in that area where we had heard the crying, we saw a coyote watching us a close distance away. It wasn't shy, it just looked at us for a few seconds and walked off into the brush. I never went back there after that. My particular neck of the woods is hilly. I lived deep in the countryside with my father, who was stricken with frequent seizures and, and unable to work or even live alone. My story takes place during the autumn of 2014. I was a 26-year-old college dropout at the time and working part-time jobs at a gas station. Thanks to this, I had a lot of free time on my hands most of which was spent hiking in the woods surrounding my home on one of my many solo hikes. I saw something that has changed me. As I stated before, the season had just changed to autumn and trees were starting to change into the many brilliant shades that time of year is known for. I had decided after one of my shifts at work to go get one last extended hike in before the cold started in for the year. I left the house around 2.30 p.m. and told my dad I'd be back around 7 for dinner. Warm sun, but with a cooling breeze and remarkably low humidity. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Perfect weather for a hike. I had been walking alongside a creek using a large branch turned into a makeshift walking stick. I was going my usual route for around 45 minutes when I realized the woods were quiet way too quiet. I stopped to listen, and aside from the running water to my right, there was not a sound in the forest. After shuddering from a cold chill I attributed to a breeze that had cut through the trees, I continued my trek, trying my best to match the silence of the woods with each step. Another 45 to 60 minutes passed, and my trail separated from the creek and began to loop back around towards my house. I had always dreaded the part of the hike due to the steep hills that laid out before me. I stopped to take a breather. After resuming my hike, I made it nearly three-fourths of the way through when I felt a strong wind at my back and then a loud crack somewhere in front of me, about 40 yards ahead of me and about 15 yards to the right, a young white-tailed buck stood alert but unaware of my presence. After a few seconds of taking in the beauty of the creature, I noticed the wind was still blowing and thought it was strange that the buck hadn't noticed me. I had always heard that being upwind of a deer would ensure you'd be noticed and the beast would flee. Shrugging it off, I continued walking, taking care to remain silent as to avoid spooking the buck. After walking about 15 yards, I noticed movement in the direction of the deer. Looking, I noticed he was no longer alert and had began walking slowly through the brush. I noticed something else as well. The deer was now about 30 yards away from me, but in between us, close to the ground, there was a pitch black mass moving 
under the cover of the foliage. It was much closer to the buck than to me and was approaching him. He had yet to notice it. I froze for a moment waiting to see what the strange creature was as coyotes are the only common predator around here. And this was much too large and too dark in coloration to be one of those. After the distance between the two forest dwellers shrunk to what could have been no more than ten yards, the hidden beast stopped, and with it the wind. Time seemed to freeze in that moment. The deer suddenly looked directly at me and flinched as if it were going to sprint away. But before it could take so much as a step, a large, black-like cat creature lunged at it and instantly took the deer to the ground. While shocked at the appearance of this foreign predator, I remembered there had been stories and eyewitness reports going around for the past couple of years of a large black mountain lion roaming the hills in my county. I could no longer see the animals through the brush, but I didn't need to see to know what it looked like. Quietly, I continued along my path, wanting to avoid disturbing the feasting feline. As I walked along, I realized I was getting a clearer view of the animal. It was bigger than I had expected, having only seen them on television and books, or... And the color was mesmerizing, a deeper black than anything I'd seen. Almost as if it was pulling the light towards it never to escape. I stopped to marvel at the creature. As I did, it began eating. I felt bad for the deer, but this was the circle of life and all. What felt like minutes, but couldn't have been more than a few seconds passed, and I was hit with the horrid smell that I attributed to the dead deer. That's when I noticed... The cougar wasn't black all over. Its face and hands were the typical color, aside from being covered in blood. But wait a minute. Hands. Why did it have hands where paws should have been? I began to study the creature more. Features, which just seconds before were that of a large cat, were becoming human-like before my eyes. What was once a black cougar, or mountain lion was now a large bulky man with long black hair and covered in black furs for clothing eating a freshly killed deer raw with only his hands nails and teeth I couldn't help but let out a quiet gasp but it wasn't quiet enough the man stopped his meal but didn't move for a few moments I knew I had to get out of there but I didn't want him to be able to follow me home he hadn't looked in my direction yet, and he was beginning to stand. Without thinking, I launched the stick I had been using to aid my hike back down the path in the direction I came from. After hearing the crash, the man sunk back down and began creeping in that direction, becoming a cat yet again as he moved, taking my eyes off of him as little as possible. As fast as I could without making noise, I continued along the path. Once I felt like I was far enough away, I broke into a sprint and didn't stop until I was through my back door. I haven't seen that man or the cat since, but I quickly convinced my dad to move to a new town and haven't been back to those woods. So who knows if it's still skulking around there. I knew about skinwalkers before my encounter but the thought didn't cross my mind until a few months ago when I was retelling the story to a younger cousin at a Halloween party to scare them. I've always been the paranoid type. If I hear a noise in the dark, I'd have jumped to the conclusion that there was something there that was here to hurt me. But what I experienced in June 2017 will never leave my memory. I've never done drugs or had any type of alcohol and continue to keep it that way. But me, my two brothers, and my parents all decided to move away from our old town after my uncle had just died to start fresh. We had found a nice five-bedroom house that would fit all of us. It was surrounded by woods and was always quiet. The nearest neighbor was about 90 meters away. 
the second week of us moving, me and my bigger brother Brandon decided to go to a creek that we had found the first day of us moving in. We followed the path that we had made from prior visits into these woods and reached the creek. It was a nice little creek. Occasionally, you could see some fish swim by, but not today. The creek didn't seem right. It was quiet. No birds chirping, nothing. Just the sound of the water calmly flowing. I could tell my brother was getting as scared as I was, so I suggested we leave. But him being the big brother who was never scared, he said that we should stay a while, but I am pretty sure he didn't really want to. It had only been a couple of minutes when we started to smell something so awful I can't even imagine what it could be. Rotten meat that had been left out in the heat and sprayed by a skunk. We started to get creeped out and finally decided to leave. As we started to head down the trail, my brother stopped to pee. He had walked no more than 10 meters behind a bush to take care of his business when I heard a scratching sound behind me. I turned to see what was making this strange noise and was met with the most terrifying thing I have ever seen. A tall, almost 10 foot figure stood between me and a tree about 5 meters away, poking half of its body from the tree looking at me. It had pale white skin, dog-like ears, and patches of fur scattered all over its body. That the thing that scared me the most, it was whispering my name. Justin. It kept repeating my name. I screamed louder than I've ever screamed, but my brother ran to my side and when he seen this thing, he just grabbed my arm and started running with me. We didn't look back. We slammed open the door to our house, screaming and babbling. Our parents rushed over to us and asked what was wrong. I was trying to explain it, what had just happened, but I I couldn't. My brother was just quiet and was staring out of the living room window. My parents checked what he was looking at and could finally figure out what happened. Instead of grabbing the shotgun we had next to the fireplace, my dad said to run to the car, and we left as fast as we could. Since that encounter, we have called the police and they didn't even seem like they thought we were crazy. They actually believed us and did a scan of those woods, but nothing was uncovered. We never moved out of that house, and I've never touched a tree belonging to those woods since. I made friends in my new location a few months later and told them this story. They didn't seem to have a clue about what it was until I asked my friend Adam, and he said one word, Skinwalker. This happened about seven or eight years ago. I was 16 or 17. I was with my sister, her husband and her husband's sister, and two cousins. We were driving back from Cortez, going through the mountains near Steamboat, Arizona. It was late at night and all we could see ahead of us was darkness and tall trees. We were driving a white pickup truck I was sitting in the front with my sister and her husband and the others were sitting in the back of the truck bed. All of a sudden, a coyote ran in front of us so we said a prayer. When that happens, it's supposed to be bad luck. We were driving for I don't know how long when three or four more ran in front of us again. After that, we started seeing owls. Now owls, those are very, very bad luck. It's said that when you see them, it means someone will get hurt bad in your family. But that's mainly just a Navajo thing. We saw like six of them, and the weird thing about that was there was six of us. So as the night grew darker, we pulled over. I jumped in the back, and one of the cousins got up front. We were about five minutes away from the house on a dirt road. We could even see the house, and... We were going about 30 miles an hour when all of a sudden something big and black jumped in front of us. We hit that thing so hard that the front of the truck was completely smashed in. When we realized what had just happened, we got out of the truck and looked around. 
the weird thing about this is whatever it was jumped out on the right side of us, but there was this big fence there blocking the whole side. So after a few seconds of realizing what happened, we went in front of the truck and saw a few drops of blood and hair. We tried to get the truck started, but it wouldn't work, and only one of the headlights on the left side was working. So we shined the light out there, trying to look for whatever we hit, but we couldn't find anything. No footprints, no blood drops, nothing anywhere. Then all of a sudden, in the distance, we started hearing two people laughing and whistling, running around us and hiding in the shadows. We knew what it was, and we just started praying in Navajo. Fifteen minutes went by, and they were still there laughing. An evil, scary laugh. Then one of the guys we were with decides to run back to the house and get help, since we can see the house from where we're at. While we were waiting, we noticed that we could hear only one person around us. We were scared and didn't know what was going to happen. Then in the distance, we saw truck lights turning on and coming towards us. We were so happy. When they got there, the guy that ran to get help told us that one of the things was following him. He said he could hear it running in the shadows near him. He also said that while he was running by an empty water tank, he could hear the laughing echoing off the tank. When we got back to the house, we called the cops. But when they showed up, we told them what happened. So he told us to take him to where it happened. The truck was still parked there with one headlight on. The cop was flashing his light around looking for whatever we hit, but he couldn't find anything. No footprints walking off, nothing. I mean, we hit that thing so hard it should have just died, but we couldn't find it. While we were telling the officer what happened, we got this strong sense like he didn't want to be there. And we didn't either. The following day, we called in a medicine man and had ourselves blessed. I live in Pennsylvania, just outside the city of Reading. There's a lot of thick forests around here, but nothing ridiculous, and it's mostly suburbs where I am. Farther out is highway and farmland. Lucky for me, I live right up at the edge of a small community at, at the very top of a hill. The forest is literally across the street from me. Anyway, somewhere about a year ago, maybe two, my dad and I were outside having a personal chat about some recent tough events going on in my house when suddenly we hear a weird sound in the forest across the road. We both stopped and looked over. I didn't think deer came out this late, I said. My dad just stared at me looking kind of confused. Then suddenly we heard someone yell. It sounded like they were saying help and that they were bleeding. We both sat there staring into the woods where it came from. My dad stood up and said to get inside. We both rushed in and I watched him run upstairs to grab his handgun. My dad's a rough sort of guy and always heads for his gun if he thinks something's going down. And something was definitely going down. I opened our back door again to our deck. It was a glass door and peeked back towards the forest to see if anyone would come sprinting out or something. Keep in mind, we're at the edge of the suburbs and not exactly used to hearing people scream bloody murder in the middle of the night. Then I heard it. This loud, weird screech. It was like a cat or a woman, but it definitely wasn't human. It was weird. Like it was high-pitched, but not. And the sound filled the entire neighborhood for a full ten seconds before it suddenly went silent. I slammed the glass door shut and ran to the stairs just in time to see my dad stomping down in boots with his pistol. Did you hear that? I remembered asking him. He nodded and we both headed out the front. By now a bunch of our neighbors were coming outside too. The scream was really fucking loud, but I didn't even expect all these people to come out this late. It was almost midnight. 
My dad went down to the street and looked up at the forest. Another guy came up to my dad and had some kind of handgun too. I watched them start chatting for a bit until suddenly another one of those screams pierced the air again. It was horrible and made me feel sick to my stomach. It went on for something like another 10 seconds and then just suddenly cut off. Like idiots, my dad and this random neighbor guy decide to point their guns towards the forest and head in. I couldn't believe it. I mean, my dad's a hunter and he's been doing it since he was a kid and he's almost 40. But there's no way I'd do something like that. They must have been in the forest for a good 20 minutes together, searching the darkness for God knows what. I sat outside with a bunch of neighbors that entire time, staring into the forest and waiting. Eventually they came back just fine. They stuck together the entire time according to my dad and thought they saw something like a tall guy in the forest at some point. When they tried to see if he was the one screaming, apparently he got on all fours and hauled ass into the forest. We were all pretty shaken up but parted ways and headed back to our houses. It was pretty weird and no police or anything ever checked it out but eventually we all moved past it. A long while after, there was a separate incident that didn't exactly connect to the first. Later that year, I was sitting outside with my friend on my back porch. We were talking and having a grand old time just messing around when I saw my cat Jinx pawing at my glass window. What a stupid cat, my friend said. I agreed with him and played with the cat putting my finger on the window while he pawed at my finger wherever it went. That's not what's weird though. Later that night, I was in my room playing a game with my window open. My cat was somewhere in the house, along with all of our dogs, so I know he was fine. Anyway, I was sitting there playing some games with my window open when I heard what sounds like a cat meowing outside. I paused my game wondering if Jinx had gotten outside. I went to my window to listen and I heard that meow again, but it was a long, deep one that you hear from a cat when they're pissed off and backed into a corner with their claws out. I recognized it wasn't my cat, but it was still coming from the woods behind my house, so, so I stared into them and tried to see where the stray was and what it was getting so mad at. The cat did that long, angry meow again, and it sounded sort of close to my actual yard. I heard some shuffling in the woods, and then something weird happened. I thought I could hear someone talking, except it wasn't like a normal person's voice. It was like some mentally unstable person trying to mimic someone else really badly. It sounded like it was trying to say, stupid cat but it sounded very distorted. Immediately I got creeped out, but since my window was on the second floor, I felt fairly safe to keep listening. Then I realized the voice was changing. Stupid cat. It clicked. It sounded like something trying to sound like my friend, but doing a really, really bad job. Then there was a serious scuffle. I heard twigs breaking and the cat just going ape shit. I mean, it was really screeching and meowing like it was fighting for life or death. Then there was this loud thumping sound. It was like something big and heavy smacking against something else solid. After that the meowing stopped completely and whatever was out there was dead silent. I was pretty creeped out by this point and I shut my window and had real trouble sleeping that night. Nothing's really happened since aside from one incident where I was getting a drink late one night and thought I saw someone crouching really super low on my back porch and looking into my glass door. Like I saw light reflected off of their eyes when you see an animal at night or something. The door was locked and it really freaked me out made me sprint up to my room and wake up my dad. But he didn't find anyone or anything. I've been assuming it was just me being scared from all the previous occurrences. We had an encounter here that was like a cougar stalking us. 
but in a very human way. It was at one point walking on its hind legs, and it called my friend from the trees by name in a somewhat human lady voice. He didn't go to it, but came back to the fire from using the bathroom and was very scared. We were camping and staying the night, so we all stayed near the fire. Then all slept together by it all night, instead of in our tents. It was a pretty buggy mosquito night as well, which sucked and we all got bit up to hell. I saw the cougar all night long. In the trees, it watched us. None of us walked away from the fire to use the bathroom after that. We would just turn and pee sort of into a ditch nearby where everyone could see. I'm always armed when I go camping, but I was very afraid this time. This animal didn't seem natural. Not like a predator should be. This was on the res in Washington State. I've seen so many cougar here, I'm pretty used to them. But this one was very off. It seemed almost clever. It didn't really hide either. It just watched us. It didn't attack, run away, or anything. It walked on its hind legs from one big tree to another, just like a person, then would run up the tree. These animals are scary enough naturally, and to see one acting so strangely was a very bad feeling. I don't think it was really a cougar. Plus, my friend did say it said his name. It wasn't growling or anything like that, but like a regular woman's voice, and he was scared shitless, and he slept in the middle of us the entire night, so he would be the farthest from this animal. In the morning it was gone, and we never went back to that site again. In late May of last year, I was home alone in the middle of the day. I live in the Midwest and there's not much around my home just my small town and a few lakes. It started to rain and I ran outside to grab up the tablecloths from the tables after a party I had the day before. They were right at the end of our property and there's nothing else around but other homes and there's miles of thick woods in between. As I was running back inside to avoid the cold wet rain, I heard what sounded like a woman or young child screaming. It sounded extremely close, and I was freaked out, but I thought someone needed help. Then I got a whiff of what I could only explain as burned hair or dried blood, something like that. It was like sniffing powder copper. I called out and strained to hear all the noises when the scream came again. It was like someone was just screaming at the top of their lungs in a painful, crackling, heartbreaking scream. I realized it was coming from the woods and quickly ran to the barbed wire fence line. I called out and was about to squeeze through the wire when I heard a snarkling, snapping noise. My first thought was, oh my god, an animal is attacking a neighbor or something. Now, I'm 5'1 and quite small. I knew I could only help by running inside and calling 911. Before I could turn and run back home, something moved in the corner of my eye. Out from the trees stepped a six-point buck. It walked towards me and I just couldn't look away. It carried itself strangely, like its legs were all different lengths. It looked like it was special, something wrong with it. I don't know how to explain it. I snapped out of my gaze and quickly turned and started running to get help for that woman or girl or baby I heard screaming when another painful shriek sounded out. I turned to see in horror that it was the buck screaming this ungodly scream. It was the same one I had been hearing the entire time, and it was obvious that it was coming from the deer. It took another crazy uneven step towards me and stood up on its hind legs and opened its mouth. It started talking or trying to, but it wasn't making real words. 
It's like those internet videos you see that are for comedy, but it sounds like a cat or dog is talking. At this point, I had all but collapsed in shock and fear. I was crying and shaking and couldn't get my legs to run away. I was completely frozen. It jumped over the fence and landed on all fours, but quickly flopped onto its stomach and started crawling towards me. It was like a strange swimming motion or army-style crawling. It kept getting closer and closer to me and adrenaline finally kicked in and I ran. Behind me, I could hear more horrible talking. This time, it sounded like it was saying welcome, but not being able to complete the whole word or pronounce it properly at all. The syllables were all stretched out. I got inside and slammed the door and locked it. I looked out of the glass frame in the front door and saw it was still coming. It had collapsed on its side and lay there howling and making a cackling noise. I left the door to get the phone and when I came back and looked out of it, the creature was gone. A minute later, it was right at the door looking inside with the side of its face. I hid in the hallway around the corner and called 911. I lied and said someone was trying to break in because if I said a deer was terrorizing me, I thought they would laugh or ignore me. When I looked back around the corner, I saw a bloody man pounding the glass with the palm of his hand. He had the same stare that that buck had, and I knew it was the same creature, somehow. And then it said, Honey, I'm back. I hid silently and the policeman got there about 15 minutes later, finding nothing he scoffed at me and wrote down what I told him anyways. My family and friends thought I was crazy and I started to agree with them after a while. Some days I still can't believe it happened. Some nights I lie awake and think of how that thing has the voice of a child. I had a rather disturbing experience, and I would like to share it. It was late at night, and I was, and still, currently am, having sleeping problems. I decided to walk to my mother's house, which requires me to walk through a wooded area. At the time, I was walking by an office building, which is also by a cut-off park, there's an area that has no street lights. As I passed through it, I got a terrible feeling, like I was being watched. I ignored it, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement in the trees. I glanced over, but quickly dismissed it. There's a lot of lights and a clearing a few hundred meters back. As I continued to walk down the road, I was approaching a corner that has woods on one side along with the trail and a back road. I kept to the right, avoiding the woods. I kept hearing what was obviously a bipedal creature walking because I could hear them walking and crunching through the hard snow and ice. I stopped and placed my hand on my knife, fearing people are going to attack me. It's pretty common where I live. After a moment, it stopped. I saw nothing in the trees. I carefully walked away, keeping a close eye on that area. I turned the corner and I still haven't turned my back to the area where I heard the noises when to my left, in the trees, something quickly sprinted off into the woods. I turned as quickly as I could, but it was already gone. That's when I decided to go back. I thought it could be a cougar or something dangerous. I quickly made my way down and back. As I passed the office building, this time on my right, I looked over at that same direction of woods, and I saw somebody standing by the picnic table. At the top of some stairs that connect to the same trail, I heard those footsteps. 
I tried to get a good look at whoever it was by stopping and staring, but when I did, they ran off. This gave me a sense of dread, and I was sure it was some guys planning to mug me, so I started to run. Once I reached the bottom of the hill, I heard somebody yell, hey, but the sound of it froze me dead in my tracks. It sounded horrifying, distorted and strained. It just was not normal. I looked over at the woods and scanned the tree line when I saw what looked like a deer, but it was standing on its hind legs. Now, I have seen deer do that, but not for more than a few seconds, and not like this. It was standing as still as stone, like it was normal, and it was looking right at me. Now, I'm Native American, so part of me immediately knew what this was, but part of me wanted to deny it. I knew it was a skinwalker. I trembled at the thought of one. I couldn't bear the thought of being face to face with one, and I was frozen in fear. And I'm a rather large man. I stand six foot tall and weigh around 240 pounds, but in that moment I was ready to cry. It wasn't until it started hobbling towards me that I started screaming at it like I was trying to scare off an animal, but it didn't phase it. And it wasn't until I pulled out my knife that it stopped, like it knew what it was. And we stared at each other for a moment before somebody in a house behind me opened the door to see what I was yelling about. It immediately ran into the woods, letting out an absolutely horrible scream. And just as quickly, the man yelled at me to come inside, and as soon as I did, he asked me how long I was out there with that thing. I couldn't even tell how long it was. He let me stay the night, and the next day he told me to go see an elder to get blessed. I asked him what it was, even though I already knew. He told me it was something I should never talk about aloud. He also told me not to go out at night anymore, or alone. He said once it takes an interest in you, it doesn't let go. So, every night since, I have trouble sleeping. I hope getting this off my chest will at least help somewhat. It happened the summer after my graduation. I got a call from one of my neighbors asking if I could tend to her garden while her and her husband went on a fishing trip. I took the walk down the hill with my dogs through the brush so she could lay out the details of specific care for her plants. Now, my family have known this woman since we moved into our home 20 years ago and as children we would all go down to visit her, play cards, chit chat, she'd even let us play in our swimming pool sometimes in the summer. I trust her completely and have house sat for her before. So, it was no odd request for my sister and I to go out and help. Her garden was new and absolutely beautiful. I have a garden of my own, but it was nothing compared to hers. It was gated and in beautiful condition. The mosquitoes were horrid though, so she made her instructions short and I retreated back up to the hill to inform my little sister of our assignment. The first day was terribly hot. My sister and I attempted to get up early to evade the heat and bloodsuckers, but in the end they were all sitting in the shade waiting for us to arrive. It took a full hour and a half to completely soak the entire garden, and by then we were sweating and itchy from the mosquitoes, and quite irritable to be honest. We were supposed to water the garden every morning, so that the sun wouldn't dry up the water throughout the day. So I got up early to wake my sister who, after yesterday's entertainment, refused to go down with me, protesting that she wanted to sleep in and to leave her alone. Not wanting to be held responsible for the demise of our neighbor's vegetables, 
I reluctantly trotted down the path to my neighbor's house. Both of my dogs were off on some squirrel chasing adventure, so I made the trip alone. Only a few birds were out that morning, and the closer I got, the more quiet it became. My attention, however, was on the sun, and I wanted to finish my task as soon as possible. When I was almost done, I took a stretch and went to turn off the hose, wiping the sweat from my forehead. Across the field from the garden, I thought I heard a person, which would have been very odd, so I stood still to listen. What I heard was my sister calling my name in a shrill voice. My sister and I would often call each other in strange, exaggerated screeches and voices in just that particular way. I knew for a fact my sister is far too lazy to hike all the way down and sneak through the brush across the field just to yell my name. I listened again, but I heard nothing. Finishing up, I assumed I had just misheard, believing it to have been a bird or something, though the odd happening stuck in my mind. Later on, I referred the account to my sister who laughed and joked with me that it must have been this creature her friend told her about. The creature she was referring to was called a skinwalker. Now, I don't know what these creatures are or if they actually exist, but if they were to, I suppose they would live in this kind of area. I put it out of my mind anyways. I don't really believe in such things. The next day, I was with my sister tending the garden and my dog came down to see us. I was shocked to see her paw was all bloody. Thinking she had cut herself on a piece of sheet metal, I ran with her back up to the house to see if I could clean and fix it. My sister didn't want to come up with me, so she stayed in the garden to finish up watering her part. It turned out the blood of my dog's paw was not her own. She had simply caught an unfortunate pack rat who she'd delightfully torn to pieces. When I came back down, my sister wasn't in the garden. Confused, I began to walk to my neighbor's house when she came outside to meet me. She told me she had heard her name being called from across the field in my voice, and the same way I had heard mine. She was visibly spooked and insisted we go back up to our house and leave the garden for tomorrow. I refused and told her she could go up without me if she wanted, but I had to finish. I suspected she was only messing with me, and I was waiting for her to give up her ruse right away, like she normally would. Instead, she stayed with me, holding her arms and refusing to walk up alone. Once we finished, we both came back together for the next three mornings to water the garden, and no other occurrences happened. To this day... My sister claims she was not lying. I'm not sure if these creatures are supposed to be smart enough or talented enough to pull off stunts so specific. We've lived in the same house in the middle of the woods for our whole lives, and we can be loud and silly without fear of annoying anyone, but if someone or something had been close enough to listen, they definitely had plenty of time to do so. And how these occurrences only happen when we're alone gives me goosebumps. I wish I had more answers. My story begins in Colorado. I was 14 years old at the time. My family was taking a trip to visit my grandmother who lives deep in the country. We were planning to stay over a few nights and enjoy the peace and quiet of the country. Now, I've always been more of an indoorsy person, but I did love taking a nice hike through the woods from time to time. The highway drive was long and uneventful, but once we finally got there, I was super excited. After all, I had my own room in the beautiful cabin my grandmother lived in, with an amazing view of the lake and the forest surrounding the property. I exchanged greetings with her and, after a few minutes of idle conversation, headed to my room. I pulled out my laptop 
and began to get a setup for a quality gaming session when I first heard the howling. It sounded like a wolf's cry, but slower, almost distorted. Like if you recorded it and played it back at half the speed and lowered the pitch. It was creepy, no doubt, but having little to no experience living in the country, I brushed it off, mentally categorizing it as just a different animal. Soon, the sun began to set, and I was indeed tired, partly due to the long car ride. I began to get settled into bed, and despite the thick comforter, something didn't feel right. It's a feeling hard to describe, like something was misplaced or missing. I didn't know what it was, so I brushed it off, telling myself it was just the weird feeling of sleeping in an unfamiliar place. Eventually, I drifted off. I woke up around 10 in the morning, feeling very well rested. Looking through my window, I could see it had gotten foggy, and there were billowing clouds of mist drifting through the trees. It was raining too, and heavily. It was hard to see through the windows due to the excessive amount of water droplets. I threw on some pajamas and went to grab some breakfast. When I walked in, there was a note on the kitchen table. According to it, my family left the house to grab some medication for my grandma. They said they'd be back in a couple of hours. So, eating my frosted flakes, sitting on the comfortable couch directly under the living room window watching the rain and fog, I heard that howl again. It was slow and thick, almost sounding deliberate. As it happened, I noticed a figure creep forward in the fog. Now, of course foggy weather in the country can be extremely thick and I couldn't see anything over five feet from the window. I could barely make it out, but it looked like a wolf. Almost. The feeling that something was wrong, very, very wrong with the animal hit me. Then the realization that the creature was standing on its back legs. Its back legs. I was shocked, confused. When I finally could think clearly, I looked at the creature in more detail. Its legs were twisted and bent in weird ways, almost like it was hit by a car. Up here by the cabin, though, the closest road that's often used is a good mile away. As I looked on in horror, the creature spun around on its two hind legs and sprinted. Straight up sprinted, disappearing instantly into the thick fog. And as it turned, though, I could see it had no tail. Like, literally none at all, like it was ripped off. I instantly ran back to my room, shut and locked the door, and trying to forget the horrific sight I'd just seen. When my family finally got back around three, I waited until my parents were out of the room to tell my grandma. My parents wouldn't believe me anyways. I knew that my grandma was Native American, but not that she was Navajo. She told me what she believed I saw was a skinwalker. Supposedly a shapeshifter. A spirit or witch that takes the form of animals in order to harm people. But it can never perfectly replicate the animal it takes the form of. We left three days later. I was happy to get out of those woods. After researching the legend of the Skinwalker, I honestly believe that's what I saw. So to all those listening, be careful when you go deep into the countryside of Colorado. If I had met that creature when I was outside of the cabin, I may not have been here to tell this story. I live in a small town in the country. There are more cows than people and some of the buildings are very old. 
This happened when I was about eight years old and is the first time I've brought myself to tell this story. I only have the courage now because I'm far away from those trees. I lived in a valley and the woods surrounded our house on all sides. Now my entire family has lived in this area for generations and there are countless stories of paranormal things happening to all of us. Several strange things have happened to me, but this is one of the most terrifying. So living in a small town in the middle of nowhere, there wasn't really anything to do other than hike. I loved hiking and would repeatedly walk in the woods for hours. There was an old story that my grandmother told me of a creature that lived in the woods and would stalk anyone who entered. As a kid, I thought, yeah, right, and that it was probably just a trick. But this day, I stayed out a little later than I intended to, and it started getting dark. Turning back, I began to walk towards my house when I heard a noise behind me. It wasn't uncommon to see a chipmunk or a bird, but when I turned around, there was nothing there. Shrugging it off, I continued, but the sounds grew louder and louder. You could hear the leaves rustle and the branches snapping behind me. I began to get scared. You always hear those stories of kids being kidnapped because they're alone, so I started to run, which was not the smartest idea. I tripped over a branch and fell, skinning my knee pretty bad. Turning around quickly, I thought I was done for, but there was still nothing behind me. Just trees and leaves. It was dead quiet. Even the wind wasn't rustling the leaves around. There wasn't a single bird singing and feeling pretty silly. I got up, brushed myself off, and turned to walk the rest of the way home when I saw it. To this day, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a deer. I live in the country and know what these things look like. This thing was in the distance, staring at me. It was covered in fur and had these piercing white eyes, and what looked like horns or antlers were protruding from its head. I knew it saw me because it seemed to smile, and I swear all of its teeth were sharp fangs. I instantly wanted to scream and run, but when I looked into its eyes, I was frozen. I couldn't even blink, let alone scream. I could only stand there dumbly as it got closer and closer. The closer it got, the more bony it looked. Its limbs were long and it looked starved. It stank like rotten flesh and I felt like crying, but I couldn't. I honestly thought it was all over until it stopped. Its head tilted just a little and it looked at me, then turned and walked away. When it left, I could move again. And when I felt like I could walk without falling, I ran home. I shut myself in my room and bawled my eyes out for hours. I didn't go back in the woods for years and even now I'm very weary of it. I don't know what it was or why it was there, but I got the message loud and clear. Stay away. That happened well over ten years ago, and was really the only major experience I had in the woods. Until recently. Now, growing up here, I've seen more strange things in the woods than I can count, but most of them aren't anything to be concerned with. Except recently, something dark has been moving in the woods. It looks like a man sometimes, but changes shape. It ducks in between trees and hides just on the edge of the woods. I thought I was crazy, but my close friends have seen it too. This thing gives off an evil feeling. One of my friends were pushed down the hill and swears he saw this dark entity out of the corner of his eye. When it happened, another one of my friends swears they heard laughter coming from the trees. This thing gives me the creeps. 
I'm not sure what it is or if it's that same creature, that Wendigo I seen so many years ago, but it definitely isn't friendly. Before I tell this story, I need to give a little background. This happened in early 2012. I had turned 12 about a month before, and the cabin we were staying at had three floors to it. A basement with two bedrooms and a furnace. A middle floor with a bathroom and a kitchen, and a top floor. It was an open bedroom with two beds. The cabin was built on a slant the front of the cabin facing towards the empty road and the back facing a forested area with a tree line. The nearest gas station was about two miles from the cabin. Now on to my story. Me, my dad, my stepmom's stepbrothers, and my dad's buddy and his girlfriend had gotten to the cabin. Fresh snow had fallen on the ground due to the cabin being on a pretty empty mountain in the middle of nowhere. We all went to our rooms to unpack, and after we did, we went to bed. We had arrived pretty late, and things went pretty normal that night. The next morning, me and my oldest stepbrother had gone downstairs and ate breakfast. We then went outside to play in the snow in our snow gear, so we were playing outside on the side of the house when my stepbrother has to use the bathroom inside. I stayed outside and kept playing, and as I was playing I noticed a tall figure on all fours. The figure was almost as pale as the snow itself, with patches of brown rotting fur and sunken in pale blue eyes. It had gangly long limbs with long fingers. Each finger held a long gray claw. The weirdest part about the figure was that it had a deer skull with rotting antlers instead of a head. The creature looked at me and let out an ear-piercing scream and ran back into the tree line. I pissed my pants on the spot. My stepbrother came back out and asked why I looked so pale. I just told him I was cold from being outside and went back in. Later that night, I couldn't sleep because I kept thinking about the thing I saw earlier. Then, I heard a scraping noise along the cabin. It sounded like nails on a chalkboard, so I snuck out of bed and looked downstairs, and my jaw dropped. Outside, walking along the porch, was this thing I saw earlier, scraping its antlers along the cabin wall. It stopped and looked up at me its pale blue glowing eyes staring back and I almost screamed. I turned to go downstairs, but by the time I checked for it again, it had vanished. Since then, I haven't seen the creature, but several years later, I finally found out what I had seen. It was a Wendigo. My cousins invited me out to go on a camping trip to some hidden state park or whatever. I happily agreed because, hey, Ohio has to be better than Indiana, right? So I drove out to their house and we pack up our tent and food and head out in this truck for a few hours into the boondocks. After miles of twists and turns, the road gets bumpy and I wake up. We were off the grid completely dirt roads and grass everywhere. We park the truck and head up to the hills for a couple of miles and make base camp at the top of a hill overlooking a valley. Nightfall comes fast and around one or so. Sitting around the fire, I ask my friends the park's name. They break out in laughter and say it's not a park but native land and we're camping on some sacred hill. I called bullshit, but they came up with a name, which at the time sounded legit enough to not argue against. A few minutes later, we hear this screaming howl that just drifts across the hills and right into our bones. We all grew up hunting and have been around the country and had our fair share of animal encounters and calls, and none of us could agree on what this was. If anything, 
I would say a screaming fox, but deeper, like a wolf, because of the howl it carried. This goes on a few more times, and our laughter soon becomes uneasy, and it seems to be getting closer. The fifth scream sounded like it was coming from down in the valley next to us, so we all look over in that direction, and I don't care if you believe me or not, but I'll never forget this for the rest of my life. Out of the tree line, we see what looks like a gangly, thin, naked man who from far away seems way too tall for normal. This thing takes off in a sprint on two legs towards us and without hesitation all three of us run off the hill and into the woods towards the car. Being nighttime, it only made this escape more terrifying. As we reach the bottom of the hill, we hear the scream again, this time from where our camp was. None of us turn back to check or even see if the others are close to us. After the fastest two mile run in my life, we get to the truck and floor it off. We head to the nearest McDonald's where we sat until dawn with no words to each other. We agreed to go back in the morning and grab our things. We did, and to our surprise, nothing had moved or was taken. This seemed kind of weird because if someone was messing with us, they would have trashed the place or at least took a few things. We drove back to my uncle's house where we tried to joke about it and move on. It didn't bother me that much until I saw my friend playing this game called Until Dawn. I became uneasy about how closely it resembled what we saw. I try to tell him that these things are real and they are out there. When I was 14 or 15 I was a pretty heavy stoner, but was able to hide it from my parents. One night my friends, E and S, were smoking with me. We were under S's deck, which was about six feet above the ground, so we could crawl out of my friend's basement window onto a little rocky part. We had only smoked about a quarter of a tightly packed chillum when E suddenly started to flip out. She pointed out into the field in front of us. It took me a second to notice it because I had just temporarily blinded myself with the flame from the lighter. A figure was moving across the field. It looked like a person, but horribly disfigured, white, and emaciated. S couldn't see it because there was a column in his way, so I pulled him by his shoulder into my lap. After seeing it, he jumped back and started to pull open his window. He drew the knife she always kept on her belt, and I felt my stomach turn as a faint smell of rotting meat and rust reached us. We fled back into the bedroom and turned the lights off, leaving everything outside. Beyond hearing some not quite but pretty similar to coyote calls, nothing else happened that night. We were in Colorado at the time, which honestly doesn't have a huge active Native American population, but he was Navajo. We don't know what we saw. We all had different theories. We haven't talked about it since, but we've urged E to help us contact the medicine man. Here's a little background. I'm a female, and this occurred two years ago when I was 18. It took place in Maine. Every summer, my family and I go camp in Ellsworth, Maine. It's about a three hour drive from my house. The camp itself is about an hour from the nearest town. I've been going to this camp my entire life. My family owns it. And I've never had an incident like this happen before. I was watching TV in the middle of the night. Both of my brothers and my parents had gone to bed. I heard a noise coming from the kitchen and realized the dogs needed to go outside to do their business. So I took my brother's two pit bulls and my affin pincher, a tiny dog, outside. After turning on the porch light, I walked around to the front yard and I let the dogs off the leash. It's so incredibly dark in the woods in Maine that the porch light really only illuminated the porch. 
and nothing else, so I tried to keep my eye on them. I was momentarily distracted when I saw a loon, a wild bird, on the lake. When I looked back, I saw that the pit bulls were both looking at something in the woods. I couldn't see what it was, but I assumed they'd seen a squirrel or a raccoon. It was then that I realized I didn't see Alfie anywhere. She's an awfully small dog, and she's completely black. I called for her a few times and heard some soft whimpering right where the dogs had been looking earlier. I took a couple steps in that direction and called for her again, worried that she may have gotten her paw stuck between the rocks or stuck in a snake hole. Suddenly, I felt something moving behind me. I whipped around and looked down. It was Alfie. She had been staying close to me the whole time. I just hadn't seen her. So naturally, I was thinking, if Alfie is here, what the fuck is in the woods? I took another step forward, and the pit bulls began to growl. They were slowly advancing, and were now on either side of me, looking right into the blackness of the woods. I quickly picked up Alfie and began to back up very slowly. I'm not sure what I thought was there, but there are lots of animals in Maine, and I figured the dogs knew better than I did. Since I couldn't see anything, right as I turned around, I heard the most absolutely bone-chilling thing I've ever heard in my life. Coming from the direction of the woods, I heard something, or someone, call Alfie's name. It sounded almost as if it were trying to mimic me, but it was just all wrong. The voice sounded really distorted, and it almost seemed to wail. I freaked the fuck out and ran inside with the dogs. I have no idea what was out there in the woods. My camp is essentially a log cabin overlooking a lake, and our nearest neighbor, who's also family, lives at least half a mile in the opposite direction of where the thing was. What do you guys think? I was staying the night at my aunt's house visiting my sister. At the time, we barely saw each other and spent little time we had together. I felt out of place around the native side of my family, but my sister was always there to tie me into them. However, this particular night would bring us all together, regardless of blood. It was the start of the summer. I remember it was about a month before my birthday. I was about to turn 10. Even at a young age, most people know of the Skinwalker. Most of the time you hear about the monsters of the reservation because your parents or elders want you to behave or they'll come for you. But the Skinwalker holds a special place. Most people do believe it is real. Having spent the day on the res with my native family and friends, the day was coming to an end, so we decided to run home before it got too dark. Just before we reached my aunt's house, a Bureau of Indian Affairs officer pulls up next to my sister and I. In a very concerned voice, he asks us where our house was and if we needed a ride. We pointed just up ahead, and he told us to hurry and stay inside. We were a bit confused, but didn't question his orders. We began a full sprint back home. As we approached the house, my aunt was at the door frantically telling us to come inside. Once we were inside, she led us to the basement. The basement wasn't particularly scary, but... On this night it was. The windows were covered by planks of wood and blankets. A corner of the room had a mattress on the floor where the family had gathered, huddled. At this point, I heard from upstairs that someone was knocking on the door. It was an officer. My aunt and him were speaking. I couldn't hear much of it, but they both sounded worried. None of us really knew what was going on, but one of my cousins did. He was the oldest of us, besides my aunt. He told us with one word, Skidwalker. I did expect him to say something like that to freak us out, but he didn't laugh. He didn't do anything. He was serious. I became quite frightened now. We all know of the Skinwalkers. It was at this time we began hearing sirens from cop cars shrieking all over the reservation. It seemed to go on all night, but I eventually fell asleep. The next day the search was called off and stories abound. The police report mentions of a creature that was spotted near the reservation. 
Upon investigating, the creature fled and the police gave chase. And the characteristics of the creature, to which I remained very skeptical, were that it ran on all fours at incredible speed, sometimes on its elbows and knees, fleshy, like skin inside out, somewhat like an animal, but very human. An officer did take a shot at it, and it hit its mark, but it didn't take the creature down. Afterwards, they lost the creature in the night. A few days later, an older man was found dead in his home from a gunshot wound. Now that last part, I don't know if I believe, but that's how the story goes. However, I do believe they found something. To take those measures to ensure safety is not normal of them. They did find something out there. I have an experience that I would like to share. This happened when I was 14 years old. I'm now 29. This is an experience that I've only shared with a small number of people, and now I'm writing it down for the very first time. My brother, who is a hardened soldier, is still scared about what happened to us that particular evening. Now, on with the story. As a teenager, I would visit my grandma at her home on the Navajo reservation for several weeks every summer. I loved to spend time with her, eat her delicious fried bread, and hear her tell us stories. Every so often, my grandma would hire a worker, the harmless town drunk, to do odd jobs around her house and property. One evening, right before the sun went down, I was asked by my grandma to take him home, which was about four miles out of the valley where she lived. I was more than happy to do it, seeing I was only 14 years old, and being asked to drive a truck was pretty awesome. Mind you, on the reservation, no one cares that you're only 14 and driving around. Hell, there's hardly anybody to see you doing it anyways. So my nine-year-old brother jumped in the truck cab with me. While this worker and my dog shared the tailgate of the truck, we were off. After I dropped the worker off at the shack that he and his brothers called a house, we headed back down to the road to Grandma's. As I mentioned before, it was evening and the sky was a deep red as the sun began to set behind us. We were leaving a nice dust trail from the dirt road and the radio was playing music from the only station that could be picked up from the nearest town. There was nothing unusual, nothing weird. It was at this time that my eye caught movement of something in the bushes a little up the road to the right of us. I remember slowing down, thinking that it was one of the many free-roaming sheep in the area that would dart out in front of the truck. As I passed where I thought I saw it, I sped up, thinking nothing else of it. Then out of nowhere, I just felt this dark feeling of fear and dread. I had no idea why I was feeling this way, but I definitely felt that something was wrong. As I play this memory back in my mind, there were only a few clear moments that I have that evening. I clearly remember looking in my rearview mirror and seeing the dark silhouette of something very tall and very skinny that seemed to be covered with some kind of fur running behind the truck after us. Whatever it was, it wasn't a normal human, or even human at all. I remember hearing my brother crying and the dog barking ferociously at whatever was chasing us. I remember speeding very fast and shaking violently as the truck bounced on the washboard dirt road. I distinctively remember that this thing was only getting closer as my brother cried. It's coming up on your side. I remember being scared as hell and thinking that I didn't want to die. At the moment, I thought that would be our last. I remember speeding around a bend in the road and seeing a car coming towards us in the opposite direction. At that moment, I felt instant relief and felt that whatever was following us was gone. Shaken up, but alive. We made it to Grandma's house wondering what the hell just happened. We ran inside, not looking back, hoping that whatever was chasing us had not followed us home. As we told my grandma about our experience, she didn't seem too surprised, which surprised us. She continued by repeating stories that we had already heard at one point or another about black magic, witches, and something the Navajos call Yi Nadalushi, or Skinwalkers. Needless to say, 
I didn't even want to look out any of the windows all the rest of the night. As a matter of fact, I never drove on the reservation at night again until I was about 21 years old. Without going too deep into explanation, I'll just say that these skinwalkers are evil men and spirits that use black magic for evil doing. I tell you that as far-fetched as it may sound, they are real. I believe that. If God and his greatness are real, the devil is equally as real, and also has ways of showing himself. This may not sound scary to some readers, and that may be due to my lack of writing skills, but what happened that evening really did happen scared the living crap out of me. I invite anybody to visit this part of Arizona if you have any doubt or want a huge scare. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. I grew up in a small town on the Gulf of Mexico. Our neighborhood was next to a huge field on the other side of the field, the gulf itself. Not extremely relevant, just for a setting. My childhood home was laid out where my bedroom and my parents' bedroom were on opposite sides of the living room, which is where the front door was. I normally stayed up late, much later than my parents. They didn't mind much, as I didn't get into much trouble just playing video games all night. I had fallen asleep playing Super Mario RPG, mid-battle and all when I woke up to my dad calling me into the living room. So I got up, walked out of my room. Every light in the house was off. I called out, Dad? He called me again from the living room. I don't recall the exact verbiage used, but he called me by name and was calling me to him. The living room was completely empty with not a single light on. I stood there, my eyes peering around the room which was dimly lit from a nearby streetlight seeping through those blinds. Dad? Again, he called out to me. This time, though, his voice came from beyond the front door. In retrospect, of course, something was wrong. But as a young boy, being called to in the middle of the night by their father's voice, the first thing I thought was that he obviously needed my help for some reason. I approached the front door slowly, very slowly partially out of confusion, partially out of grogginess. As I approached, my dad called to me again, then again, and again. Each call beckoned in a friendly but urgent tone. I was within reach of the doorknob, and I stood there. At this point, I felt something was a little off. Maybe I was sleepwalking or caught in some vapor of sleep or something. I paused for a few seconds to really drink in my surroundings, feel my environment. This gave me time to truly take in the details. I was perceptive. I was awake. There was no mistaking it. Dad? Silence. Dad. Then I heard him once more, stern this time, like he was when I was in trouble. Get out here now. Oh shit, it's serious, I think to myself. I reach for the door. What are you doing? It was my mother, right behind me. Her voice in contrast to everything I was feeling at that moment fucking terrified me. It was the most startled I had been in my life. But that record wouldn't last long. Dad's outside, calling me. I think he needs me, was my reply to her inquiry. Dad's in the bedroom asleep. Were you dreaming it? This phrase is one of my most vivid memories. Just thinking about it has me covered in chills. Record shattered. This was by far the most terrifying single moment in my life. No, I know for a fact I wasn't dreaming. I don't sleepwalk. I remember waking up. I remember it very clearly because I had fallen asleep during a battle in Super Mario RPG and when I woke back up, Mallow was the only person left standing in my party. And then, right after that was when I first heard something luring me outside. Maybe that's what woke me up in the first place. The act of fear didn't last long, surprisingly. I had no idea what could have been out there. The thought of what it could have been depressed me. I had no response to the bombshell my mother had just dropped on me. I was emotionally exhausted by fear. 
you know that sickly, exhausted feeling you get when you receive absolutely terrible news. I simply muttered goodnight to her, shuffled back to my room, and laid there on the floor until I passed out from emotional exhaustion. I have never encountered anything like this since then. This just seems like the place to share this story without instantly being told that I was just sleepwalking, given that I have not one other single instance of known sleepwalking. And this turned out to be longer than I expected, and I feel very mixed at having immortalized these words. Essentially, part of me feels good to share it to a receptive audience, but the other part of me feels like I'm just stirring some shit. Again, this is 100% factual. I didn't enhance any details. I've told this story for 20 years now, the exact same way. It's one of the clearest memories I have from my childhood. I of course don't know if it was a skinwalker. I have no idea what the fuck it was. All I know is that it was something. And... It almost tricked me. I was spending a month with my cousins at my grandma's house. It was August and my cousins ages ranged from 10 to 15 and I was the oldest being 15. I was staying with a 10, 13 and 14 year old. We stayed up telling scary stories often but one night, a few weeks in, we decided to make a campfire out back. My grandma's house is in a rural suburb. The neighbors aren't too far when you're driving down the road to her house, but in the backyard, it's thick forest with man-made paths through it. Each house is on a hill, so only part of the basement was actually underground. That isn't important until later, though. We were towards the east side of her yard in a smallish patch of open land. You couldn't see the neighboring yards from there and there was probably three quarters of a mile to each side of us that belonged to my grandma. It was maybe 11 at night and we were playing truth or dare after telling scary stories and my 14 year old cousin dared me and the 13 year old to go walk through the paths for 10 minutes or so. I said yes right away as I wasn't easily scared or rather level headed but my younger cousin was a bit more hesitant. We didn't bring a flashlight because it wasn't pitch dark yet and we could see enough to not die. We were walking through the paths for about five minutes and could barely see the fire through the trees when we decided to turn. In the middle of the path was a large, dog-like creature hunched over with its front hands an inch from the ground. What I remember most was how its eyes were so fucking bright white and it was a humanoid dog shape with a human-like head but a dog-like body but human hands and feet. It looked right at us and I know I was paralyzed with fear as it dashed away the opposite side from us, towards a creek that ran through the yard. Eventually, my cousin and I screamed bloody effing murder, and the other cousins and my grandma ran to us. I don't remember much here because I was really disoriented and I couldn't think properly. But I did wake up in bed, so I assumed that I got brought to the house. All the kids slept in the basement in a big room with a sliding glass door to the outside. As the room was on the side that wasn't underground, my bed was pressed against a big glass window, and I could see my cousins playing outside down below. The house is in Michigan, so it gets slightly chilly even in the end of August, and there was a slight breeze, so I put on a jacket and ran to join them outside, skipping breakfast, not wanting to miss out on anything fun. When I got down, I could tell they weren't playing, but rather running to get my grandma. Her dogs, both of them, were dead, ripped up. That night, we went to bed early. I woke up at maybe 2 in the morning because I felt something hit my head. My cousins were all sitting in the double bed opposite me on the other side of the room. There was one bunk bed and two double beds. The double beds for me and my 14 year old cousin. They were being quiet and staring at me. The 13 year old nodded his head towards the window. I froze. They all looked afraid. I turned my head slightly to the side and I saw a really messed up looking face pressed to the window with gaping eyes looking down at me. I screamed so fucking loud. It bolted. My grandma called the police after I told her what happened and they found nothing. I went home after that, and I have never been there during the night again. As a young man, my father spent some time living on the Navajo Indian Reservation in the Four Corners area. He and his buddy lived alone in a trailer that overlooked a ravine several miles away from a mountain. It wasn't uncommon for him and his friend to hear drums coming from the mountain at night. 
The locals told them to not go out after dark when the drums were playing because witches were on the mountain and would try to do them harm. My father broke his leg and soon found himself confined to the lonely trailer. One day, his friend had to go out to a meeting and my father was left alone at the trailer. As night fell, the drums began on the mountain. My father tried to occupy his mind with other things, but soon he began to hear strange sounds just outside of the trailer. Footsteps in the yard, things scraping along the side of the trailer, and creaking floorboards on the porch. Leaving his crutches in the trailer, my father grabbed a baseball bat and stepped out onto the porch. Only the empty yard was there to greet him. He heard a sound behind him and spun around. Nothing was there. Thinking an animal or person might be sneaking around the trailer, he crept off the porch, squeezing the baseball bat, and headed towards the corner of the trailer. When he rounded the corner, nothing was there. The hairs began to stand up on the back of his neck, and he suspected his visitor was not an animal after all. From the far corner of the trailer, he heard the sound again. He began shivering at this point and stepped lightly towards the corner of the trailer. The drums were loud on the mountain, and from where he was, he could see yellow pinpricks of light. Torches, winding their way up the side of the mountain. At that moment, my father became aware of a commotion in front of him. The sound of dozens of feet shuffling through the ravine just below. He eased forward, half of him wanting to flee, the other half unable to look away, until he stood at the edge of the ravine. His breath stopped short. A horde of desert creatures, coyotes, lizards, and birds were marching together in an unending body through the ravine and towards the mountain. As his eyes were taking in the bizarre spectacle, he felt something closing in behind him. The feeling you get when someone is just standing directly behind you. Without turning around, my father bolted around the trailer, hobbling on his leg cast and sped away in his pickup truck, his heart racing. He didn't return to the trailer alone. Soon afterwards, he related his experience to some of the locals. They told him of the skinwalkers, members of the community who are secretly witches. They perform atrocious acts to gain the power to become whatever animal they wear the skin of. My father had seen dozens of these witches, these skinwalkers, heading towards one of their ceremonies. As to the invisible creature stalking him around the trailer, he has no idea what it was. I'm Navajo, and I heard a lot of stories growing up on the reservation. While I've never seen anything myself, which I am grateful for, I have benefited by being around the people who have. There is a different kind of evil that exists in the quiet high deserts and deep sandstone canyons of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and even Colorado. I can only describe it as an ancient evil. There are helpful ceremonies, rituals, and traditions that are still practiced to this day. Hell, even a local hospital has an on-duty medicine man. But this all seems to be a double-edged sword. What I mean is there is also black magic, which most Navajo will not even acknowledge or speak of. We are very superstitious and heavy with taboos. You will find this with most First Nation people from Alaska to Argentina. It's just something you don't do, in fear that it will get the attention of unwanted spirits or other harmful beings. Skinwalkers are just a few stories that kept me up at night with the covers over my head. 
And here's one I'd like to share with you guys. A Navajo tribal police officer was driving west on the highway. It was lightly snowing, maybe a fourth of an inch, which is a lot of snow for the location. He sees an old woman walking on the side of the road. How she got there, or where she was going, was not apparent, because she was so far out in the middle of nowhere. He didn't see her right away, but as he passes, he noticed that she's dressed in traditional clothing. A shawl, dress, moccasins, and her hair in the traditional bun. This in itself isn't too odd. Many elders still choose to dress this way. But why was she out in such cold weather, this late at night? Hitchhiking, maybe? He passed her too quickly and now had to turn around. And as he makes a U-turn, he notices that she is nowhere to be seen. This is fairly flat terrain, and he for sure seen an old woman walking. He pulls the squad car over and steps out with his flashlight. Confused, he manages to find the woman's footprints in the shallow snow. He follows the footprints until they suddenly turn into what looks like dog footprints, leading away from the road in a hurry. He immediately jumps back into the squad car and meets up with another officer near his patrol. He's a little shaken up, but asks the other officer if he has ever seen anything like that. The officer tells him that he has. He also explains that sometimes it's an old woman and sometimes it's a very beautiful young girl. But it's always on that road. And it's always when it's snowing. Waiting for the right good Samaritan to stop and let her into the car. I still get nervous driving those wide open spaces at night. I keep my eyes strictly on the road and turn my music up high. I rarely pick up hitchhikers, but I never pick them up at night. I finally turned 19, the big age for Mormons where I get to leave for two years of my life and share my gospel as an LDS missionary. I get my calling, which is where and when you'll serve, open it up and see that I've been called to serve in the Farmington, New Mexico mission. My best buddy, who happens to be Navajo, gets super excited for me because my area covers all of the reservation. I get stoked as well and get prepared to leave in a few months. Within that time period, my buddy gives me some heads up about what I'll witness on the res. And of course, one of those has to be the skinwalkers. The white men, for good reason, still aren't that liked on the reservation. So he warned me to be humble and kind and to try not to warrant any bad juju in my direction. I agreed to this and left for my two years. The first month was pretty uneventful. I prepared in Utah, then flew out to Farmington where I met my mission president and where my first area would be. I got assigned to the town of Nohachi a tiny dot of a place on the reservation. We lived in a trailer behind the local church because there weren't really any houses for rent out in the middle of the res. Here's where things get weird. My first week. Uh, seriously, my first week I'm there, this happens to me. Missionaries have a strict schedule during the day. We pray, eat, go teach, and come home to do a few push-ups and are in bed by nine. So me and my companion, whose name I won't share because I'm not sure if he'd enjoy being mentioned in this story, start to do our little workout when all of a sudden we hear some footsteps outside. 
This creeped us out a little bit, but sadly, the area has a lot of drunk residents that stumble around until they're eventually picked up by the police or family members. We brush it off and keep on with our routine. That is, until the steps are right outside of our door. Now mind you, I'm six foot, semi-athletic, and 160 pounds, so I'm definitely not going to try to pick a fight with anyone. But my companion was 6'5 and 280 pounds. Let's just say I felt a little bit safer around him. But then, the person outside starts pounding on our door. I looked over to my friend and he looked a little worried. More cautious than anything. Like I said, non-natives aren't very popular on the res and it wouldn't be out of the ordinary for someone to try to rob or frighten us kind of a get the hell out of here kind of message. Here's the freaky part though. The pounding of fists turned into scratching almost instantaneously. Our first thoughts were, oh shit, he has a dog. We came to the conclusion to grab our weights and just try to sleep through this. Well, nothing else eventful happened that night. It was rough falling asleep, but once I did, everything seemed fine. The next morning, we walked outside to see if we could Sherlock Holmes together some evidence to see if we knew who it was, or any beer cans we could find to verify our suspicions. What we found was terrifying and shocking to say the least. We were right. Boot prints leading to our door. But where we should have found boot prints leading away, we found paw prints. I remember seeing them like it was yesterday. A bit bigger than a dog's. I figured they were a coyote or maybe a wolf. We couldn't understand what we were seeing. Why weren't there boot prints leading away? Or paw prints leading to? We didn't say it out loud but I think we came to the same conclusion. Whatever knocked on our door had changed shape right then and there. The day went on uneventful. We told our bishop and he knocked it off as just a drunkard bugging us. He said to pray and stay safe by being indoors before dark. Nothing else crazy really happened but I started having some of the worst night terrors of my life. I would have my back to our door when I woke up in my dream. I didn't even have to turn around to feel the unholy energy that was gravitating from whatever was inside of our trailer. I had no voice and would silently plead in the name of Jesus Christ, but nothing helped. It stepped on the corner of my bed and it felt as if my entire mattress was lifted. It then drove me into my bed, ripping the breath from my lungs. I would start crying and praying to God to protect me from this thing. Then in a second, I would be awake in cold sweat, crying and trying to wake my companion up. This happened to me the next week, every night without fail. Long story short, I ended up going home early. It was mentally taxing reliving that every night. The nightmares instantly went away when I got home. If anyone has any experiences with skinwalkers and the curses they can hex people with, I sure would like to know more about it. Maybe that's what I was experiencing, but it scared me half to death and was the most dreadful two months of my life. When I was 10, my parents died and I went to live with my grandmother. We are Native American and my grandmother lived in Native American community. She would always tell me stories about the great spirits and the soul of the forest. My favorite one was about this great chief who tamed the fox spirit. So when I got a dog for my 12th birthday, I named him Fox. 
Fox and I were best friends. As soon as I would get home, Fox and I would go play in the forest until the owls came out. Fox was very kind and well-managed. He almost never barked and certainly never at people. Living in a community full of Native Americans, we would often run into others in the forest. One day, we saw a middle-aged woman, 45-ish, and Fox went crazy, barking, snarling, baring his teeth, the whole nine yards. When I managed to calm him and take him home, I told my grandmother what happened. She only asked one thing. What color were her eyes? I answered, yellow. She then looked very shocked and sad at the same time. She picked up Fox and stared into his eyes for what seemed like forever. Finally, she sat him down and told me that the woman was a skinwalker. Skinwalkers use old and dark magic, the type that can only be earned from the dark spirits. A skinwalker steals the forms of different creatures they have killed. Once the creature has been killed, the soul is offered to the dark spirits. The dark spirit in turn grants them the power to become that creature. They will often take the forms of lost family pets. Then they will kill the entire family and offer the soul to the spirits. With each soul given, they gain more power. The most powerful can take the forms of people they have claimed. Skinwalkers look like normal people and animals, except for their eyes. Once touched by darkness, the soul is changed and twisted, which is reflected by the eyes since the eyes are a gateway into one's soul. She never mentioned the story again, and she never let Fox out without me with him. She only asked that we return before dark. When we would get home from anything, she would always stare into my eyes for several minutes. Afterwards, she would give me a hug and tell me that she loved me. Years have gone by and I'm a college student now. My dorm won't allow pets, so I had to leave Fox with my very old grandmother. While she was out getting her hair done one day, her house got broken into and Fox got out. He returned hours after my grandmother got home and I rushed to see him. Three hours later, when I arrived, I found the door open and my grandmother lying on the floor lifeless. The police said it was natural causes and suspect no foul play. I don't know if I'm just being paranoid about an old story my grandmother told me, or if I should be worried about the skinwalkers. I live on a reservation. I'm almost 19 now. I was 17 at the time this happened, and it's always been a standing rule that we can't leave our house after sunset. There's always been bad things happening, people going missing, animals going missing, animals showing up, and animals being mutilated, weird stuff like that. That year, I was allowed to have a few friends over for my birthday party. I was really excited because this land is beautiful and I always like to show it off. Three of my friends made it up here, two boys and a girl. I'll just refer to them as boy one, boy two, and girl. We went for a long walk up in the mountain, a little ways from the res, because the view up there is amazing. And even though it was getting on to dusk, I figured we'd be fine. There's four of us all in a group together, and we've got hiking sticks with the spears at the end, and it's only a 20 minute walk there and back. Boy one saw the end of a goat but it was missing a tail and it looked injured. We tried to get closer to see if it was all right because all the goats around here are owned by someone. But as we got closer, it made a really loud bleat and ran over the ridge. 
Boy One and I ran off the track after it and looked over the ridge. It had disappeared. We stopped so we could hear which direction it was running to. But there was no noise at all. I thought it was a bit weird and the sun was disappearing faster than I thought so we started to head back. My friends would always laugh at the rules my family has about going outside at night, but they were about to find out why, and I was about to get a fresh reminder. Boy One was leading us with his phone light. It wasn't that dark that we couldn't see in front of us, but the trail has drops and rocks, and because of the bushes to the sides of us, it made it really hard to see our feet. There was this strange giggle in front of us. We stopped because it was really close. It sounded like a turkey gobble, which is uncommon in my area. It happened a few more times after that. The sound gave me goosebumps because it didn't sound right at all. The next thing we saw still plays with my head. Going from left to right across the path was this thing. My heart jumped into my throat. It looked like a large coyote but its limbs were mutilated like it was crossed with a human. It had sharp long claws, its face distorted and human, but animalistic at the same time, and it had really long teeth. The scariest part is the way it moved. It was rocking back and forth on all fours like a praying mantis. It would just take a step and rock backwards and forwards, then lurch another step. Its head was bowed down in between its shoulders. None of us moved for what seemed like a couple of minutes. We just watched it jolt itself across the path awkwardly. It looked like it was just going to go past us and leave us alone until the girl started crying and freaking out. The animal flung its head in her direction and made a really low growl, sort of like a house cat. It twisted its body around and started coming towards us. It was terrifying. I yelled and threw my spear at its head, but it just bounced off. When it got to me, it stood up on its hind legs. It was so tall. Then it barged into me, making me fall down. It started making this hiccuping sound and then barged into boy one and backed into boy two and he landed in a ditch just off of the trail. There was hardly any light on us now. When it got to the girl, it contorted its body over the top of her and held her down. She started screaming. Boy two got up and hit it with his hiking pole hard. It jolted away up the path behind us making a crying noise like it was mocking the girl, like it was just playing with us. We picked ourselves up and ran as fast as we could back down the path and across the reservation to my place. We told my mom what happened, and she told me and my friends the legend of the Skinwalkers. I didn't sleep very well that night. I kept waking up to a crying sound outside that would just stop as soon as my ears adjusted to being awake. I didn't want to look outside my curtains. I never wanted to see that thing's face again. The girl said that when it was on her, it was hissing in her ear and whispering things to her that she didn't understand. I still get nightmares about this encounter. This didn't happen to me, but a very close friend of mine. I've heard a lot about coyotes and skinwalkers, and had a weird experience or two with coyotes. The creepiest was waking up to my sleeping bag being surrounded in paw prints without ever hearing them during the night, but never anything paranormal, so to speak. Patrick's story, however, kept me from going back to my favorite backcountry secret stash. He was leaving the area one morning. He had been camping there a couple days and said it was a coyote that always seemed to be close by, like in his peripheral vision, but never obvious. He loaded up his truck and started to drive down the washout to the fire road. 
At the end of the wash, he could see the coyote following him. When he pulled onto the road, it was running next to him. Now, he was freaked out, so he sped up. He said he was going 35 or so, and it was just running along beside him. Definitely not something that should be possible. When he looked back, the coyote was running on two legs, and was wearing what Patrick said looked like buckskin pants. An instant later, it was a person wearing a coyote fur keeping pace with his truck. When he looked again, it was gone. We never went back to the grove after that. I was staying at my grandpa's trailer in Arizona for a couple of days with my mom, my dad, and two brothers. I forget why we went out there, but it had to be important because my dad never tagged along with us out there. Anyways, come nighttime, and everyone is asleep except for me. I'm watching Nickelodeon on the TV in the living room when I hear footsteps walking up the front porch. Since my grandpa was up there in years, he had a long wooden ramp to his door. I was expecting something to come to the door and knock, but nothing happened. I just kept hearing it walk up and down the ramp. My grandpa lived about 25 minutes away from the nearest town, and the only neighbors around are other family members. I remember being really scared at this point and couldn't even think straight. My brothers were asleep in the living room and on the couches near me. I couldn't force myself to wake them up. Instead, I calmly walked to the back bedroom where my mom and dad are asleep. I laid down on the floor and tried to go back to sleep myself. Meanwhile, whatever is walking around outside is still doing its thing. After a couple of minutes, I hear my mom attempt to wake up my dad and see if he can hear it. This relieves me because I thought she was asleep the whole time. I told her that I hear it too, so we laid there and listened. My dad is not the best at being coherent after sleep and falls back asleep right away. It stops after a couple of minutes. The next night, the same thing happens, except it's coming up to the back door. I freak out again and this time just go to the back bedroom and lay down and go to sleep. That's all I remember. I also forgot to mention a weird thing my grandpa said that made sense later. Before turning into sleep, he said something like, don't pay attention to anything you hear at night. You'll be safe inside. I should also mention that the next day I remember seeing boot prints and paw prints in the sand by the ramp. This takes place around Christmas. It was cold outside, but I was asked to walk my dog, so I did. I heard the clicking my dog makes when he walks, but my dog is going to the bathroom at the time. I was pretty freaked out. I knew this was wrong, but I had to turn around. When I did, I saw the biggest thing I've ever seen in my life. I yanked on my dog's leash and run towards my house, which is so far down the road. I still hear the clicking noises coming from behind me, but it's not my dog. I know that for sure. My grandmother's house is right by my house, and at the time my grandmother was over at my house. Once I make it into the light, he reveals this thing laughing at me, in my own father's voice. Then it starts to run behind me again. I hear the noise of my mother saying, come back, I really want to play. Almost getting to my driveway, I hear it saying, no matter where you go, it's going to be easy to find you. Just stop now. My parents heard me screaming and running outside now. I get into the house and we all hear voices and screaming on the windows. 
My grandmother brings me to my room and tells me what is happening. She says skinwalkers will connect with a human until they get what they want. At this point, I'm terrified. She still goes on to talk about what they are and what they do to you. Three weeks later, we still hear scratching at the windows, and it's just as scary as it was that night it all started. We're looking to move, but we know that it might follow us wherever we go. My mother and I lived on the Navajo Reservation, on a large cattle and horse ranch when we moved back from California. It was just the two of us, our three dogs, and the horses and cows. The place we lived at was very rural, and 70 miles away from any towns, 15 miles away from any neighbors, and very heavily wooded. It started off as a normal day. Being the age of seven years old, I was playing inside my room with my action figures. My mom's vehicle was getting repaired in a local town at the auto center, which left us with no transportation. But my uncles came to check on us, and we had no telephone or cell phone or satellite TV. Since my mom got divorced, my father left us with no money, so we were pretty poor. Visitors were usually non-existent, with the exception of my family coming over. So when a large old truck came driving up behind the house, where two old cars sat on cement blocks were, it seemed pretty odd. Four men stepped out of the vehicle, and my mom went to check on why they were parked behind our house. I could see from my bedroom the back of the house. Normally people parked in the front when visiting. My mom talked to them in Navajo, as one of the guys motions to the old blue car and pointed at the back of his truck. My mom shook her head. The other guy started getting angry and was talking loudly to her, but she still shook her head. After a few more minutes of this, the guys got into their cars and left. They sounded angry by the sound of the truck peeling off down the dirt road. My mom came back in and I asked her who they were. She said they wanted the old blue car and asked my older cousin if they could have it and that he said yes, but she said she didn't believe them. So she says, no, you can't take this car. My nephew will need it to be here when you do take it. And it isn't polite to be sneaking up on people parking behind their homes. She said the guys got upset but said they'd be back. That night after we ate dinner, I went to sleep, I remember. She washed dishes and put wood in the fire and fed the horses and dogs. It was around two in the morning that the dogs started barking. My mom shook me awake and told me to hide in the closet. It was dark and I was scared shitless. There was banging on the windows and doors with what sounded like metal objects. I remember hearing laughter and whispers near my window. The smell of decaying meat or decaying potatoes. It was horrible. My mom was openly as scared as I was, but she held a wood axe close to her. The dogs were running around the house barking and soon I heard two of them yelp in pain. My mom shouted at whoever was out there to go away or she'd kill them. The one dog outside sounded like it got into a fight with something as the other dogs joined in. Then something jumped onto the roof while something else was hitting the kitchen door with a metal bar or tool or something and scratching at the back door. We could make out in a strange voice. You should have let us take that car. Something growled near the window in Navajo. My mom yelled at whatever or whoever was out there to get the hell away from us. We heard laughing and what sounded like coyote yipping near the front of the house. A few minutes later, heavy pawed feet were heard near the barn, where the metal slab sheets to put on top of the barn roof were laid out for the next day. It sounded like a small pack of two or three. My mom opened the door to check. 
near the security light pole sat what looked like a deformed coyote staring at us. My mom threw a small brick that was near the door and it moved its face to avoid being hit. This coyote had to have been a skinwalker. It got up and ran in an almost limping fashion away, the tail flapping like dead weight as it ran. In the distance past the barn, we could hear the old truck starting up. As it revved off, something sounded like a dog jumped into the back of the truck. The next day, my mom found that two of my dogs had bite wounds on their leg and ear. My other dog had a big raised goose bump on its head like someone hit it with something big. The paint on the doors had long gashes from some type of metal objects and the back door had claw marks on them where it sounded like something was scratching at the door. Clotted blood was rubbed on the outside of the wall on the front porch. My mom knows it was those guys who came over wanting the old car parked in the back of the house. They came back for us. Just for fun and for that old car. I was going for a walk. It was late and I had nothing else to do. I was about a mile away from my house and was walking on a path in a field far from the main road. It was about 2 a.m. but it wasn't a problem as my parents trusted that I would return home. Anyways, I was walking past a tree line when I started to hear static, like an old radio. That was the only thing I could compare it to. I was rather frightened by this, but I decided to keep walking. Then I heard in a child's voice, Help. I stopped short. I looked at the tree line frozen, debating on what to do. I stuck one foot out to where the noise came from, and again I heard the voice repeating what it had just said. This time I felt a bit uneasy. The voice sounded so similar to the first time it had called out, as if someone was just repeating a recording. And also it had a bit of a static sound to it. I can't really explain it very well. But I called out. Hello? There was no answer. My voice was shaky from fear. I didn't know what to think of the voice. And then it spoke again. But, in my voice, it said hello. It sounded just like me, but with that same static-like noise. It said it again. Same exact tone from the first time. I backed up a bit, terrified of what I had just heard. I turned and started walking away in a fast pace. I heard a branch snap behind me and I stopped. I looked back and saw a deer, looking at me from the tree line. I was a bit confused by this. Was it really a deer? I thought to myself. Then I kind of just threw the idea away because of how stupid it sounded to me. I ignored the deer and started walking again. I walked for not even a minute and heard something behind me again. I quickly turned to see the same deer standing on the path. Now that it was out in the open and with what moonlight there was showing on it, I saw it more clearly. It had the head of a deer, but the body looked like a human slumped over on all fours. The ribs were slightly showing. It took me a second to realize just how big this thing was. If it were a person, they would have been huge. I stood there frozen for what seemed like a minute and this thing started to stand up. When it was fully standing, it was easily over seven foot tall. It stood perfect like a human would. I tried to think of the situation logically. My assumption was that this was a tall person trying to scare me, 
but the head was too real, and I dismissed this quickly. After a bit of staring at this creature, I finally decided to take a step back. As I did this, the creature took a step forward, not making a sound. I stood frozen again, scared to make a noise, and then this thing said hello, in my voice, the exact way it had the previous times. I was more confused than scared at this point, thinking to run or escape or anything. I was thinking to myself, how could this thing speak? I asked it, what are you? It was silent for a bit, and then the thing spoke. In my voice again, with that same static sound accompanying it, repeating what I had just said, still staring at me. I was just frozen, staring at the thing while it did the same thing. I wanted to run or something, but my body wouldn't let me. I just stayed in that same position for what seemed like hours. Finally, for no reason, it walked away, back into the tree line. This was also a little terrifying to witness. It walked on two feet, like any normal person would, until it was out of sight. As soon as it got silent, I sped quickly down the path back towards my house. I was sure I would get home, no problem, but I was wrong. I heard another branch break and I started sprinting even faster, not knowing what was going to happen. I started to see the main road to my house. It was in sight, but still a distance away. I heard this thing scream. It sounded like a child screaming at the top of their lungs, branches still breaking behind me. I'm sure it was running above the trees. When I got onto the road and got a few hundred feet from my home, all the noises stopped. I looked back over my shoulder and saw it standing there in the middle of the road just staring at me. Right before I turned to continue running, I heard it loudly say hello. It never followed me after that. And that's the last time I ever encountered it, or even heard it. This story comes from myself. It occurred two years ago on a hiking trip with my father. I will also mention I was 16 at the time this story occurs. Okay, so it was nearing the end of August. My father had decided to take me on a hiking trip into the woods that lay on the edge of our property. This set of forest is quite expansive and is a nice place for a hike. Plenty of hills, small patches of clearings, and so on. We ride out on our ATVs and pack up and begin to hike. If I remember correctly, we got to the trail about 5 p.m. and began walking at 5.20 or around that time. It was very beautiful with a crisp breeze here and there. Suddenly, we hear a noise. We are about 20 minutes into the woods from where we begin. This noise sounds like it's coming from around 20 to 30 feet ahead of us. It's loud, like someone dropped a boulder from the top of a tree. I'm naturally a skittish person, so I jump immediately upon hearing it. My dad starts laughing at me and asks me what's wrong. And I respond with, Dad, didn't you hear that? He doesn't seem too worried. Yeah, why? What was it? He then informs me it was likely a bear dropping from a tree, or possibly a large bird taking flight. It doesn't add up in my imaginative mind. What kind of bird makes a noise like that? We continue on the hike, and we find a tree. Every branch on one side is completely broken like a large animal slid down breaking every branch. I believe this is the source of the noise I heard earlier. I point and tell my dad to look. We both begin investigating the tree. 
and he tells me it's definitely a bear that slid down the tree, but I don't believe him, but I go with it. We are now around 45 to 50 minutes into the hike. We stop to rest and eat a bit. We both pack sandwiches, me with a turkey, and my dad with chicken salad. And he loves chicken salad sandwiches. And we talk about how nice it was out there and finish eating. And it's about 6.20 now, and we begin hiking again. And about 10 minutes in, my dad stops me. He squats down. William, come here. I walk up beside him and squat down as well. What is it, I ask. He points at the mud and I'm chilled to the core. On the ground are a trail of footprints, unlike any animal I've ever seen. The back of them were slim, and they start to get wider as they reach the toes. The toes are long and thin with a faint claw mark at the end of each. My dad tells me he's never seen anything like them. I'm now making connections in my head. Broken tree branches, odd footprints, multiple versions of horrific creatures are running through my mind. He tells me that we should turn around and head back. Not because he's scared, but because it's getting kind of late. And it's 6.35 and we are getting tired. We turn around to start heading back. As we pass a clearing in the trees, I see something out of the corner of my eye. I'm tearing up right now as I type this just thinking of it. Standing in the clearing, about 15 or so feet away, is a tall, dark creature. It's just looking up at the sky. Its face is like a bird's. It has a long beak and sharp facial build. Its body is thin, and its arms hang down to its knees, with long fingers on each hand. I start crying and scream for my dad to look but it doesn't come out as a scream. It's just a squeak. I yank on his jacket, and he turns around to face me. I just point at the direction it's standing at. He's completely silent. The whole world is just silent. For a moment, I thought time had stopped. The thing had no interest in us. It's just looking at the sky. I looked up in a tree above the thing, and there's a mangled body of some animal torn beyond recognition. It's just staring up at it. And we start to run, faster than we've ever ran before. I didn't hear anything following, so I guess it wasn't too interested in us. We reach the ATVs and hightail it the hell out of there, not looking back. And when we get back home, not a word is spoken. We just go in, sit down, and watch TV. Even now when I bring it up with him, he just tells me he doesn't want to talk about it. We haven't gone back to that hiking trail. I don't think we ever will. When I was in my first year of college, I have lived with my mom by ourselves. My dad had passed the year before. We moved out of the house shortly after. I was kind of glad because I had suffered a lot of paranormal trauma growing up there and was glad to get out. One night I was driving home on Highway 111 North after a youth group. I saw something that still bewilds me. It was lightly raining that night. Mist crawled across the road from the cow fields on either side. The lights from the few gas stations nearby were reflected in the wet asphalt. I was driving about three car lengths behind a dark minivan with nobody else in sight on the roads. All of a sudden, I saw the van swerve to miss something in the middle of the road. I was going too fast and the road was too slick to miss it. All of a sudden, I saw framed in my headlights and silhouetted in the glowing red brake lights of the van speeding away. A tall, muscular man with the upper shoulders and head of a buck It was like a minotaur, but a deer head instead of a bull, and glowing eyes. I clenched, embraced for impact, and then passed right through the figure. It was like it dissolved right into the mist. I am used to swerving to miss deer at night, but I should have nailed this thing on the driver's side. 
Nothing. I was too afraid to look in the rearview mirror as I gassed it and sped home. I was only a couple miles away, which was both comforting and terrifying at the same time. I raced in the door and locked it behind me. I told my mom who laughed it off but was disconcerted at my pale, clammy complexion. I only later found in research at being describing like what I saw, the Wendigo, a Native American legend that was terrifying to me as a child, but I had never heard it described like this. I had never heard of any creature like this until that night on a dark Highway 111 that I will never forget. My grandmother on my mother's side has always been very superstitious, for lack of a better word. She's not religious, but she does believe in a lot of paranormal stuff. Her mother was full-blooded Navajo, and her father was Irish. Either way, she'd never been anywhere east of Montana. She grew up in Nevada. One year, when I was in grade school, we went to visit her. Most of the visit was pretty uneventful. Typical, boring old people stuff. Except she always kept her curtains drawn and shut and would always peek out the window. And when someone asked her what she was doing, she would simply reply, Yendalushi is watching me. And this went on for nearly the entire visit till a few days before we were due to leave. My grandma and my then baby brother He's 19 now. We're in front of the yard that evening planting flowers. When all of a sudden my grandmother starts shouting my little brother's name. Get away from that creature. It's not safe. And of course, being in Nevada, we all assumed that my brother had found a scorpion or a rattlesnake. And we all run outside to see my grandmother clutching my little brother and shaking in terror against the side of the house. Standing out in the yard was a large black dog and he was staring at my grandmother with an intensity I'd never seen before. It looked up at us, gave a huff, and ran off. And I don't remember if it moved unusually fast or not, but I do remember it had really deep yellow eyes. And when my mother asked my grandmother what happened, she kept repeating, The Andalusi has found me. We moved a couple weeks after that. And this is the first time I've ever seen anything out of the ordinary, and it's by far the most horrifying moment of my life. I used to go hiking on a trail near my home in Tennessee. We lived out in the boondocks, so I was pretty much used to the woods. I would always go out for a walk with my basset hound Flash every evening. Just the other day was the first time I've ever seen Flash growl and yelp the way he did. We were coming around a bend right next to a small pond that was completely overgrown with thin trees. Suddenly Flash started growling and barking his head off. I looked where he was facing but I couldn't see anything. I kept walking but he wouldn't follow. Then he started yelping as if someone had kicked him right in the gut. Just the sound of him panicking freaked me out enough to back up a bit. And that's when I heard something crashing through the woods ahead of us, along with the most foul smell I've ever smelled. It smelled like death and vomit. I stood close to Flash and started backing up when something broke through the thick foliage ahead of us. I had never seen anything like this creature before, and it all happened so fast. I'll do my best to explain what it looked like. It was the shape of a large dog, with really long fur, as if the thing had never been groomed. Even the snout protruded outward like a canine, but there were sharp fangs hanging from its maw on either side. Weirdest of all though, there were antlers on its head, and the thing honestly looked like a carnivorous rabid deer, except this thing was far too bulky and short to be a deer. I took off towards home at full speed, glancing behind me as I ran. After the third or fourth glance, the thing must have run off as well, because I could no longer see it. But I didn't slow down. For all I knew, 
that thing could have been stalking me. I didn't stop to catch my breath until I was home with every door locked. I haven't seen anything since then, and I hope I never do. I just really miss going on walks. Every year, every summer, I used to go camping with my dad. I can't remember the name of the area because it was a long time ago. It was the 7th of August though, the date we always go camping. It was 2001 and we had arrived at our spot. It was right next to the lake. The lake was huge. My dad told stories of a monster living near the lake that preys upon unlucky campers like us. I never believed him until that day. We had set up our tents for the night because it was going to get dark soon and we needed a place to sleep. Before I continue, I just want to tell you who was there. There was me, my dad, my two uncles, and my friend Mike. And that isn't his real name, I'm just protecting his privacy. The sun was about to set, so me and Mike went on a walk before the day was over. Mike was afraid of everything, so as I walked, I teased him with stories of the creature of the lake. We were so caught up in our stories that we hadn't realized how far we had went from camp. We turned and began to walk back. We had been walking for so long, the sun had set and it got dark very quickly. I was walking ever so slightly ahead of Mike because I had a flashlight. You all right, Mike, I said, turning around. There was no answer. As I pointed the flashlight in his direction, I saw Mike standing there with a face as white as snow. And then a foul stench hit my nose, the stench of rotting. I walked over to him. He was shaking like crazy. I whispered to him, What is it? He lifted his hand slowly and pointed into a gap in the trees. I saw a deer standing there. A deer's pretty usual around here. Let's go, I said, trying to calm him down. I aimed my flashlight at it. It looked at me and I saw it clearly. Its head was a deer with a bloody mouth and beside it was a rotting corpse. It stood up and let out a shrilling screech. It was humanoid with five long claws on each hand. Its tongue was long and pointed, almost like a worm. Its body was a slender and brownish color. And I let out a blood-curdling scream just before tossing my flashlight at it, grabbing Mike and running. I never ran faster in my life. Well, it took an hour to walk. I ran back in seconds. Me and Mike never slept that night. And all through the night, we couldn't help but think we were being watched. I don't know if I was just hallucinating from the terror, but I swear I heard the sound of long claws on wood whenever I'm near those woods. I'm never returning to that place again. And all I hear at nights near those woods now is a shriveled voice whispering, When to go? I decided to join my bestie Karen for a three-day stay at her grandmother's place on the res. Her grandmother lives near a place called Tuba City, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere, but surrounded by rural homes. We go to college together, and I was kind of interested to know about Navajo tradition. The first day we stayed, it was pretty chill, nothing out of the ordinary, but then her grandma, not that old, around 67 said that a stray dog came out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, it did act kind of strange and ugly. Black, shaggy coat, looking like a mix between a German Shepherd and a Lab almost. That night we were watching a movie in the living room, and they had big windows that looked out to the front yard where the cars were parked. The curtains were wide open. Grandma was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and we were watching a movie. Next to the window is a medium bookshelf where DVDs are kept. 
Karen went to put back a DVD she had just watched, but she freaked out because the stray black dog was staring at us through the window, standing on top of the wood box outside. Not something normal dogs do from my point of view, or hers. Usually my dog, which is a house dog, scratches the door to be let in. Whereas dogs aren't house dogs, and dogs inside houses are frowned upon in Navajo tradition, meant to protect the house and the owner. And the other dogs seemed to stay away from it. Karen opened the door and yelled at it to get off the box, and it ran off behind the shed. When we went to Tuba City to get some groceries, came back to the house, the dog was nowhere to be seen, nothing unusual. Grandma went to visit some people, so it was just Karen and I. And about five o'clock, we heard someone trying to open the door. Both of us looked out, and since there had been no car and no dogs barking, and looking out the living room window to the door, there was the dog trying to open the door with its paws. Two paws wrapped around the brass doorknob, standing on its hind legs. And I thought that was really weird, but wasn't actually freaked out. But Karen was. She opened the door and chased it off. Grandma came back later and Karen told her. Grandma didn't like what she heard. When we got ready to go to bed, we slept in the spare bedroom since it had two beds. One window with the curtains opened a little. And we turned off the light, but there was a sound coming from on top of the roof. Pitter-patter, footsteps, scratching sounds, and panting. And then it sounded like it jumped off onto the large plastic water barrel they had. And at first we heard what sounded like barking, but as it grew louder the other dogs seemed to be barking at something also. But all of a sudden, something was running around the house and barking. But it was no dog. No, it wasn't. The barking sounded human. A deep male voice barking, like it knew that we knew it wasn't a dog. Woof. Woof. Rough. Rough. Arf. Arf just exactly like that, adding the W's, R's, and A's, then panting again by the window, and we started to freak out. Karen decided to open the curtains and look out. There was the stray dog on its hind legs looking into our bedroom, but this time it stunk, and what I thought were two black holes in the neck, and now their pair of eyes twinkled. Think of those ugly, glossy spider eyes staring at you. And the paws were deformed-looking hands with overgrown, somewhat thick and sharp fingernails. Again, both screaming and shutting the curtains closed, Grandma came running through the door and seeing it. First thing she did was grab ashes from the fireplace, load three shells into the shotgun from under her bed, Bless herself a Navajo and went outside to shoot it, yelling in Navajo about how the thing wasn't welcome there and to get the hell out, for it to go linger somewhere else. Them both being traditional, the next day they called a medicine man to come over and put cedar in. And he prayed over everyone with cedar smoke and an eagle feather, blessed the home, made us eat bitter herbs called eagle's goal, and gave me an arrowhead. And apparently I needed to carry one for protection, and a little pouch called corn pollen. It seemed to work pretty well. And the medicine man said that the dog was a skinwalker, which in Navajo is a long word, but I call them Yoshis. And the body of the stray dog, which was killed by the skinwalker, made an illusion, so we wouldn't know it wasn't a real dog. He also said they tend to harm people by using some sort of human bone straw to spit at someone. Think spitballs only deadlier. And get human bones into them. Doctors can't detect it, but the medicine man, that day, pulled a piece of human skull out of grandma's right shoulder. Pretty big. About two inches long and one centimeter thick. And it was real because we watched him pull it out of her.
and this all happened about five years ago. One night, a few of my friends decided after a night of hanging out that we'd go on an adventure about 3 a.m. We took a ride about 50 miles to this old Spanish ruin in New Mexico that was once the seat of the Inquisition, and I can't for the life of me remember what this place is called. So we jumped the front gate to the place and start exploring. One of my friends brought a flute with him. He started playing it, and about 30 seconds into his playing, something started screaming really, really loud on the tops of the long destroyed walls of this place. And it was going from wall to wall really quick, screaming the most blood curdling scream you've ever imagined. And we got the fuck out of there and drove for a few hours to where we planned to camp out for the rest of the weekend. And when we got there, at probably 6 or 7 a.m., we set up our camp. And after a few hours just talking about what the hell happened at the ruins, I went to take a piss, probably only like 300 feet from our camp. And this is where everything starts to get a little fuzzy. And I remember seeing two dust devils coming my way. And when I turned around again, two of my friends were there. And they were motioning me to follow them. And I couldn't help but to follow them. And like I was being pulled behind them in shackles. And I followed them for what seemed like 10 or 15 minutes. And then I snapped out of it. These weren't my friends. And they had bright red hair. With my friend's faces. But cat-like eyes. And I stopped walking and they looked at me. With the most terrifying gaze I've ever seen. Monsters in movies are nothing compared to this. And I turned around and ran as fast as I could, back the way I came. And after about five minutes of full sprint, I got back to that rock that I took a piss on and found our camp. And everyone was there, still sitting around talking and didn't even notice that I was gone. And I told them what happened with the look-alike skinwalkers. And we packed everything up and left, probably within ten minutes, and got the hell back to Albuquerque. I grew up in the northernmost part of Wisconsin, on a Native American reservation. As a Native American kid, you grow up learning a lot about the mythology of our people, many mythical creatures and spirits. But I was always pretty skeptical, especially when it came to the monsters like Bigfoot or the Wendigo. But all of that changed one day. It was mid-December and it was freezing out. It had to be around negative 10 Fahrenheit. My friend David and I were at his family's house for a dinner. After the dinner was finished, his grandmother asked us if we would go out to her cabin and chop some logs. She was going out there while her husband went hunting and she wanted it to be nice and warm. Of course we told her we would. What else could we do? So we throw on our jackets and boots and headed out. It wasn't too far, less than a mile, and if we went straight into the woods instead of walking the road, it would be even faster, so that's what we did. Trekking through snow that is at times thigh high isn't fun in the best of situations, but as I said, it was negative ten. When we finally arrived, we went inside and started up a fire with a few of the remaining split logs and warmed up a bit. The crackling flames were peaceful, but David kept pacing and looking around uneasily. I asked him what was wrong and he told me he felt like he was being watched. I told him that was ridiculous and that we should start chopping wood before it got dark. So we got the axe and went outside and began to chop. We were doing that for about an hour when we first heard it. Very faintly, it sounded like a girl screaming. We thought it must have been the wind, so we went back to the logs. A few more minutes went by and we heard it again. This time, there was no mistaking it. A girl was yelling for help. Then a wolf howled. We looked at each other and ran in the direction of the scream. 
We got to a spot where all the snow was packed down and there were paw prints all around. We began to yell for her, tried to get her to answer, and that's when I heard this noise that still haunts my dreams. The only way it can be described is an angry, hateful shriek. David started running before me, but I caught up pretty quick. I was mentally kicking myself for leaving the axe back at the cabin, but that's where we were heading anyways. Once we got back, we would be fine. At least that's what I told myself. It didn't quite work out that way. Before we could get to the cabin, David fell. I turned to help him up, but he wasn't there. Just a long drag mark. I yelled for him but got no response. I started moving in the direction of the mark when I got hit. I didn't see what hit me, but I sure felt it. I was knocked off my feet and my chest felt like it was on fire. I glanced down and saw my jacket was shredded and there was a lot of blood everywhere. I couldn't breathe very well and I felt myself about to pass out. Then I saw it. It was tall. It had to be at least nine feet. Covered in thick, dirty white fur. A mouthful of fangs, but no lips. Clawed hands covered in blood and sunken eyes that were pale yellow. I wasn't sure what it was, but it didn't matter. I was losing blood quickly. I didn't know how I could survive this. But when I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. My chest was bandaged and there was a police officer by my bed. When he saw that I was awake, he asked me what happened. I told him everything. He told me that they found David's jacket and boots in the woods, but there was no sign of him. The doctor told me that I was attacked by a bear and that I had hallucinated from blood loss. Eventually, I recovered enough to be released. As far as I know, they never found David, and I haven't gone into the woods since that day. When I was young, I often spent parts of summer with my grandmother in her home out in the country. It was my favorite place in the world, and I always looked forward to the week-long stays of gardening, baking, and late-night fires with s'mores and ghost stories, and enjoying having my grandmother all to myself. There was a pond, not far from her house where I would sometimes go to swim. It was home to quite a few frogs, and at night they made the most incessant noises. I complained to my grandmother only once, saying I couldn't enjoy the night breeze with all that racket. She took me onto her lap and told me a story about an old man and woman who lived near a lake. The old man could not stand the sound of the singing frogs, but his wife told them that they kept the windigo away, and to harm them would be unwise. Well, he didn't listen and set out methodically catching all of the frogs on the lake. It was a process that took some time, but he did not stop until he had rid the lake of the pesky amphibians. That night, without the protection of the frogs, he and his wife were slaughtered by the wendigo. A vicious, demon-like creature with elongated fingers ending in razor-sharp talons and rows of silver teeth as thin and keen as needles. I wrote it off as another one of her ghost stories, though she did seem more serious than usual about it. I didn't complain about the frogs again, mostly because I grew to enjoy them and put the story out of my mind. In fact, I'd forgotten all about it until it came up this past spring in a Native American literature class I was taking in college. The mention of the Wendigo sparked that old memory of my grandmother's story. I thought she had made up the word, I didn't realize there were stories about it, originating in Algonquin legends. Eager to connect something from my childhood to the topic, I googled it, only to find that my grandmother had apparently been mistaken. There was nothing I could find about the story she had told me, 
nor any references of frogs providing protection from the Wendigo. In fact, the Wendigo of legends seemed very little like my grandmother's version. They were said to be insatiable, craving human flesh and sometimes created from the forms of people who had resorted to cannibalism to survive. Descriptions varied, but they sounded almost nothing like my grandmother's boogeyman version. I actually chuckled as I read it, almost a bit embarrassed by how badly my grandmother had messed up the original tale. I changed residences this summer, moving to a newly built thousand square foot duplex on the edge of town. The other side is to be occupied by my landlady who had built the place. However, she isn't scheduled to move the rest of her stuff in and begin living there for a couple of weeks. She's waiting on her lease to end. Even though my new place is only a few minutes from the edge of town, it feels much more isolated. I enjoy the seclusion of my new home and its proximity to a more natural setting. I'm surrounded by woods, and from my patio I can see a pond beyond the carefully landscaped lawn, which is carved out from the surrounding woodlands. Just like the pond near my grandmother's house, the frogs have put up a ferocious racket lately. I prefer not to pay to run my air conditioning if I can help it, so I have every window open to catch a breeze. That means I can hear them as clearly as if I were standing on the water's edge. It took a few days to get used to the noise, but I'm fine now. Just like I was those summers when I was young. In fact, the noise has been comforting to me during the stress of the move. Tonight is different, though. I find myself standing in my living room staring at where the pond is. Though I can't see in the dark, the air is eerily still and oppressively warm. But all of my windows are shut and I feel impossibly cold. I've long since convinced myself that my grandmother's story had just been a silly tale. A twisting of an old legend by irrelevant storytellers. But for some reason I have the most overwhelming sense of dread growing in the pit of my stomach. I don't know what to do. I feel trapped. Leaving my house means braving the darkness beyond my home. And I don't know if I'm going to be safe in here either. All I know is the frogs have stopped singing. Growing up in the mountains of North Georgia, camping and hiking were things me and my brother did so often it was second nature. So anytime Ryan and I had a break from school, we would head straight for the woods. We packed our gear, let our parents know where we were going, and that was that. No questions asked. We decided to camp about midway through Jack's River Trail. It's a trail we knew fairly well, and we had used it a few times before to practice long hikes. We arrived at the trailhead around lunchtime, parked the car, got our gear out, and headed into the woods. We passed a few hikers as we moved along and asked them how the trail looked, and the answer was always the same wet. Jack's River Trail probably crossed the river 50 times as it went along its 17 mile plus journey, and with the colder temperatures of the late fall setting in, it was harder for the trail to stay dry. We moved deeper into the trail and started to look for a place to make camp. This is where Ryan and I made our first mistake. You see, we have this rule. We don't camp near people if at all possible. Call us paranoid, but the last thing we want is for someone to drag us out of our tents and into the woods never to be seen again. So we always camped a pretty decent ways off of the trail and in an area that wasn't as popular with overnight campers. Roughly two and a half hours or so in, we found what we thought was the perfect place to set up for the two nights we were going to be out. We came up to Horseshoe Bend and ventured about half a mile off into a clearing and set up. We built a TP fire lay for that night and pitched our tents on either side. After setting up, we unloaded and decided to walk back to the trail and go exploring around some of the many swimming holes the river had to offer. 
This was during Thanksgiving break and I remember being surprised at how few people were on the trail. Maybe it was the weather or the fact that this was early in the week, but there didn't seem to be anyone hiking, much less staying the night. Around 5 o'clock, Ryan and I headed to camp to start our fire, making dinner, and to settle in for the night. As soon as the sun began to set, the cold rushed in. We added more wood to the fire and sat close and just enjoyed conversation. Ryan was two years behind me in school. I was a senior and he was a sophomore, but growing up we had always been close. We always hung out in the same groups, played the same sports, and had the same hobbies. Around nine, we were settled comfortably around the fire. I had just texted our mom to let her know we were safe and getting ready for bed, and I remember we were talking about dreading going to our grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and having the same awkward conversations we had each year with family we only saw on holidays. When things started to get strange... We were no stranger to sounds in the woods, and these woods were full of animals from deer to black bears and even the random wild boar. If you're in the woods enough, you learn to distinguish certain sounds, and what we were hearing I can only chalk up to is odd. What Ryan and I heard was what sounded like someone sneaking around slowly just out of eyesight. With an animal walking on four legs, you hear a tighter group of steps, but what we were hearing sounds very distinct to what a human sounds like when walking slowly or trying to move without making much sound. I remember we both pulled out our flashlights and shone it in the direction we thought we heard the sounds coming from, but that's what was so weird. Whenever we would fix our lights on a spot, we thought we were hearing it, and the sound would start coming from the opposite location. It was as if there were multiple people walking around us, and that's when the whistling started. At first I thought it was just the wind, and I remember thinking, the wind might just be throwing leaves around, and what we are hearing is nothing but the wilderness around us. Ryan looked at me and asked if I was hearing it too, but I didn't answer. I was trying to focus hard on each individual sound. Two consecutive notes with roughly a three or four second gap and two more consecutive notes, over and over again. He kept asking if I heard that and I put my fingers to my lips trying to keep him from talking. The fear I felt was incredible. My jaw was tight, my fist clenched, knowing I wasn't ready for whatever was out there, if it was anything at all. The whistling continued for what felt like forever, but thinking it through, it was probably only five minutes. Ryan finally yelled out into the darkness, Hey, quiet! The whistling stopped. The crunching of the wood stopped. Nothing. I looked at Ryan with a what-the-hell look, and he shrugged his shoulders. I had to do something, he said. I just shook my head. We sat there in silence for a few minutes when the woods erupted with noise. Something or someone was running in a circle around our campsite. Then the whistling came back. Two consecutive notes with the same three to four second gap and then two more consecutive notes. How could someone whistle this loudly without cracking, uh, while running no less? I was done. I stood up, shining my flashlight in all directions, trying to catch a glimpse of whatever was screwing with us. It felt close enough to touch, but we never saw a thing. That's when the movement stopped, but the whistling was still constant. It was so loud, inhumanly loud. I looked at Ryan and told him to call the police. Now, this is the part I will never forget, and it's the part I never like to talk about. While Ryan was on the phone with the dispatcher and telling them our location and what was going on, I stepped around the fire towards my tent. Inside my bag, I had a six-inch fixed blade that I always carried and thought I would feel a little bit more comfortable with it in my hand, at least more than just my flashlight. As I went to unzip my tent, trying to keep my eyes toward the woods, I heard some movement directly in front of me. I swept my light up in front of me for maybe two seconds and I saw it. 
And whatever this person or thing was, it was about five feet up in a tree. And everything about it was long. Its arms, legs, neck, and fingers. Everything. And it was fast. As soon as the light hit it, it launched backwards off of the tree. I heard it land, but it either jumped an impossible distance or landed in a thicket because I heard it but never saw. I don't think I have ever yelled so loud in my life. I ran back to where Ryan was and sat down. He kept asking me what I saw, but I couldn't answer. I just kept thinking about it. Maybe ten minutes later, we saw a couple of flashlight beams coming through the woods, and about three guys came into view asking if everything was okay. I settled down a bit and started asking them if they had seen or heard anything strange. All they said was they heard a lot of movement and then heard my scream, and that's when they headed in our direction. I tried to explain what had happened without sounding crazy, but it didn't seem to work. One of the guys walked around a bit and came back and said he didn't see anything. Ryan told them that we had called the police, and roughly 30 minutes later a park ranger showed up. Ryan and I tried explaining everything to him, but he just chalked it up to either a curious animal or some campers trying to mess with us. Either way, Ryan and I decided we weren't staying the night. We packed our stuff up and walked out of the woods with the ranger. He took our statement and we got in the car and drove home. We didn't talk about what happened that night, but neither of us have been back to Jack's River Trail and... We'll probably never go back.